good, not morning, but midday. Good midday to you, folks. It's a nice day. Nice day to be drinking coffee. Um, welcome to another Chit Chats with GitCats, number 56. Folks, I need your help. I've been given a whole bunch of stuff by my sponsors. Um, Summer Cable, ET Guitars, and Chicken Picks. And I need to give them away to you guys, but... I need your ideas on how to do it and best promote my channel because I'm crap at that stuff. So I have a little Facebook uh, group called Chit Chats with Git Cats. If you add yourself to that, I'm going to start a competition this week where I'm going to give away my first big prize pack to the person who comes up with the best idea on how to do all that because um, I think we've got a pretty good thing going here. You would not believe who I got an email from this morning saying he's coming on. So um, I'll let you guys guess who that is. But hold the line. I will announce it in about a month's time. Um, but in the meantime, there is somebody outside, uh, Ding and Dong. And who is that out there but no other than Mr. Phil Buckle. Hello, Phil. <laughs> Hello, Rick. I'm going good, mate. Um, it was a little little bit of playing around, as I said on my teaser to my Facebook page earlier. We've got two audio guys here and neither of us could work out how to get your nice interface going oh, for this so we've resorted to the ipad but it looks good mate it's adjusted light wise and everything now so you're looking great yeah that's good it was more the sound that i was uh, i was worried about but there we go we're stuck with the ipad speaker but that's okay it's an yeah. ipad pro well, yeah well, no it, it no. seems fine it seems fine we don't have any echo issues if, if we do folks let me know in the comments and i'll keep an eye on that and wear headphones but i think we're good on that phil what, what part of the world are you in right now mate i am in melbourne uh, Victoria, and yep. um, with sunny day, I can't believe it. Something that you guys are probably quite used to, but uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm on the Gold Coast myself, and nice. uh, yeah, it is. I know it's a middle of winter here, but I go for a walk down the beach, and everyone's out surfing. And oh, shut up! Yeah, yeah. With with a wetsuit on, though, you wouldn't you wouldn't tackle it without a wetsuit. <laughs> <laughs> we just come out of another lockdown so you know uh things are looking up it's great sunny day no more lockdown no more masks cool i'm hoping it stays that way mate i've got a gig coming up in a couple of weeks time at the casino up here i play in a group called absolutely 80s with um scott khan from kids in the oh, kitchen okay. brian mannix um who's on this run ali fowler we've got David from Real Life. We've got David Sideria. Yeah, I mean, yep, yeah. yeah. We've got <laughs> all these machinations. Names machinations. We've got Wilbur Wilde. Oh, it's real? gonna be a, it's gonna be a cool show. Uh, so, fingers crossed. There's no lockdowns again, and, and that everybody can actually make it up for this one because uh, oh. I haven't played a, a hometown show with those guys yet. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Well, that sounds really cool. A lot of those names are, I, I, I really know because you know I used to work in a music shop, and uh, you know like Dave Sterry and the boys from Real Life used to come in and. I remember looking at those guys saying, oh, man, i got to do that. Had that Because they were talking about their record company and they just signed a deal and they got the single coming out. I'm going, how can I? And funny enough, you know, there's a kind of a connection there because at the time, Ross Fraser was working uh, at the same shop, at the same music shop. Really? So, yeah. And I remember one day Ross said, you know, I had enough of working at this music shop. I'm going to do something else. And and uh, I sort of said, what are you going to do? He said, oh, I'm going to do something with PAs. I'm we didn't have a clue what he was talking about. And then one day, because um, I used to live just down the road from the shop, and Ross turns up in his brand new Isuzu truck. And if people don't know, Ross Fraser is the guy who produced John Farnham. We used to work in a music shop together. He was like, I think Ross is about two years older than me or something. So he was a little bit ahead of me in school, but he was a friend of my brother's. And he was also um, very instrumental in, in my development as a muso, because he used to bring all these records around and play them to me, like really groundbreaking. <laughs> Of records that I couldn't afford to buy. So anyway, so Ross comes around one day and he's got this brand new Isuzu truck. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, just bought this truck. And I said, how much was that? And he said, like 30 grand. I said, what? How are you gonna? He said, I'm going to pay it off. I said, how are you going to pay it off? He said, I'm going to build a PA and I'm going to rent it out. And that's exactly what he did. And one of the bands who rented out his PA was Real Life. Wow. And they kind of, yeah, and they kind of got to know each other. And uh, they were going into the studio. They asked him to go in and produce. So Ross Fraser was the guy that produced um, their big hit. Send, Send me an angel. angel. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and I think it was Ross's idea to put that big hand clap in there. Send me an angel. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and he used to actually trigger that hand clap from the front of the house. On his, he used to have it on his desk. Oh, really? 
Cool, cool. Because it is, it is the hook, isn't it? It's one of the one of the hooks of the song. It's it's one of the. I think uh, um, Richard's uh, synthesizer part that. That's like yeah, man. That's it. Yeah, yeah. But that was interesting, wasn't it? Because you know we just came from working in music shops. Suddenly, there's Ross now, sort of took that next step, and it wasn't long before he then got to because he started hanging around. Because I think we're real life with Glenn Wheatley. I think they were. So he's hanging around that office all the time. And Glenn said to him one day. I want to, I want to do something with John. Do you want to, do you want, you know, John Farnham, do you want to be involved? And so what does Ross do? He goes on and produces Whispering Jack. Thank you very much for coming. So, you know, all those guys that are out there working in music shops, it's a great connection point. It can be a great connection point. So many people used to come into that shop that actually went on to do stuff. You know, we had all the guys from, um, uh, what are they called? Uh, all, you know, the hair beds kind of, uh, oh man, I forget. Uh, they had, uh, Funky Town. Who was the boys? Sudo Echo, all yep. those lads used to come in, yep. buy their buy their gear from us. Um, Paul Keller used to come. In. I mean, and we were we were out in the sticks. I mean, we were like twenty five k out of Melbourne, but for some reason, I think we were one of the best stocked shops or, or something. Wow! And uh, so it, all those people would come in, and that starts to get you thinking, like, what am I doing here? You know, because I mean, I worked in that music shop for like ten years, long time. That's a big chunk of your life to spend yeah. working in a music shop. But it took me a while to learn how everything worked. You know. These bands, how they get gigs, they go and see these people, and then you've got to have an agent, and then they've got a manager, and how do you do that? And and so you learn, you know, it's a, it's a great place to kind of learn stuff. Anyway, I've probably gone off, I've gone right off track, but not at all, mate. There is no there is no on track with this show. I, I've come to realize, <laughs> as I was saying to you, mate, wherever it goes. But you mentioned working in the shop, and yeah. that's what brought you front of my, front of mind for me was talking to Brett Gusset and just asking him. Uh, well, the question, and he and he mentioned you working in the shop there and being yeah. blown away by your playing, and yeah. Oh, well, that's a nice thing for Brett to say. I was a guy. I was the one who actually. <laughs> I've told this story before, but you know, Brett used to come in, uh, but one day he came in. I was out the back making coffee or something, and he was right in the room next to me, and I and I could just hear this. <laughs> I stuck my head down and said, "What? What are you doing?" You know, because I. I he was right into the whole legato thing and yep. i hadn't really kind of started on, on that sort of stuff um and yeah that's and he used to I used to look forward to the days when he would come down because i'd always learn something from that guy i'd try and figure out what's he actually doing there you know um yeah so it, you know it, music shops are a good place to start even if you think i mean we used to sell everything we had this you know home organs and piano accordions the guy that owned the shop was a german guy so we had, used to have a lot of austrian german guys bavarian guys coming in this shop buying piano accordions and stuff. And then there'd be a, like a row of Les Pauls, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we had, the, you know, the, all the rock bands and stuff coming in. It's a great place to start, man. But, and it also makes you realize you're so close to the dream. Like, cause you'd see guys do it. You'd see guys like David Sterry come in and, and, and Richard Zatorsky, the keyboard player come in and you go, I'm this fun, you know, they're, they're doing it. Why yeah. aren't I doing it? What, how, how do I, how do I bridge that? You know? Um, and then, you know, so what do you do? You buy enough gear so you can actually build a recording studio and you start doing it yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now, where it all started. Awesome, awesome. Now, you, you mentioned um, uh, recording uh, with uh, – at. oh, sorry, you, who did you say um, you worked with at the shop? Mental blank. Oh, yeah, uh, Ross Fraser. Ross yeah, Fraser, yeah. yeah. Um, the console recorded uh, Whispering Jack is actually about a kilometre down the road oh, from yeah. my place now in a studio. The guy bought it and it's nice. in there. There you mm-hmm. go. Well, you yeah. know, the Sun's probably recorded on that console too because we um, um, uh, recorded, uh, we didn't mix our stuff there, but we recorded uh, at the same at the same place. That was in a studio in Melbourne um, called Metropolis. Metropolis, uh, yep. Which is kind of gone now, I think. You know, it's, it's so sad, all those studios that have been in there. It was a great room. So many great records were done there, all the Little River Band stuff. Well, a lot of the river, Little River Band stuff was done there. Crowded House. I remember bumping, bumping into Neil Finn in that place. Um, yeah, um, yeah, that's and, and I think actually the first state record, which is the one that preceded um, the Southern Suns when I was still, singing, I have it. Yeah, there you go. That was not was sort of mixed because I, I we had mixed it at home and Ross just had the two tracks, so they were trying to they were just trying, I guess they were kind of trying to master it there, you know. That was definitely a home demo job that got mastered on a on a on a on a, on a SSL. Wow, um, so there you go. Um, uh, but that, you know, when you're in the shop and you're selling the gear, you kind of have to learn about it. 
Yeah, I remember when compressors came in, we had these DBX incredible, I mean, now they're bloody collector's items. DBS compressors, like in a little lunchbox kind of thing. Beautiful yep. units. I didn't know what the hell a compressor was, you know. So you get the manual out and you start learning about it, you know. Yep. Um, and also the other great thing about working in a shop was we used to get great deals. You know, he, uh, the boss was a really, really lovely guy. Helmut, his name was. Helmut, uh, German name. Yep. Uh, no, uh, Bavarian. He'd hate it if I said German. Oh, um, really? Yeah. Uh, and uh, he was really, really kind with uh, you know, doing great deals for us. He'd give it everything at cost, whatever we wanted, as long as we could pay for it, of course, uh, yep. he would do it at cost. You know? So if someone come in and, and, and like trade in a Les Paul or something or a Strat and, and you know, they didn't want much for it or we, we cut a good deal, we'd be like, that's what we could buy it for kind of thing. So that's probably the reason why so many guitars went through my hands. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh man, I had uh, yeah, I had a bad reputation for uh, for going through guitar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we all no, do that, mate. That, that, you know, when when we you, you asked me to do this interview, I was thinking about the way guitar players have. I think I wonder if other people were like me. I had this. I think I had this sound in my head. I think I knew what it was, but I could never ever find that bloody sound. You know, it's like. And you just start changing pickups and then you'd start, you know, well, I'm going to try different strings. I'm going to try maybe a different neck, maybe a different, and you butcher all these bloody guitars and then you just get rid of it and buy another one and think this is going to be the one, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I just wonder how that, it's psychologically how that works because guitars are really strange beasts. I mean, there's so many things that go into making that sound and particularly, here's a good example. So you're standing on stage, yeah, you know, you, you, you're you going to do a gig, whatever you're doing a sound check, you get this sort of sound, oh, this is really, really good, this, this is happening. And then you just, all you got to do then is kneel down and play again, and you'll just go, that is the biggest piece of crap I've ever heard. It's just so toppy. It's it stand up and you go, actually, that sounds pretty good. You yep. know what I'm saying? Like, yep. that is so directional. You have yep. no idea what it's going to sound like. Mm -hmm. And um, and the reason I bring that up is because I just, I was listening to some, because I'm using a Kemper at the moment, and I was listening to a, to uh, Michael Britt, who is one of the guys who does a lot of the really great, yep. um, uh, and actually I use one of his. Um, and he was saying the thing about the campus is it's a profiler. So what it is, it's not like a uh, Axe FX, which actually emulates every part of the amplifier, every component, I, I think, I, I, I've never used one, so I don't know, but this is the way, I, this is the way I've kind of, um, um, past the information is that it you know emulates everything and then at the end of that you've got you should have something that sounds like a marshall or a fender or whatever other yep. amp you like but a kemper is a profiler what it does it uh will record or somehow electronically record the sound of a amplifier being mic'd up so it's the sound of a complete the complete sound that's it's mic'd it's yep. sounding the way you want it to sound. Now let's profile it. And a lot of guys can't get used to that. They listen to it and they go, that doesn't, there's something, what, it's not, but to All me. All down to how the app set at the time. Yeah, but yep. to me, it's like, because I sit in, in front of a pair of monitors, that's how I want to hear it. That's the, what I want to hear. I want to yeah. hear a guitar that's been mic'd up. So I took to the Kemper immediately. was like, well, that's, yeah, that's, yep. that's the way it should sound. Yeah, you know? I, I was a Kemper guy for, for a while. I was one of the first guys touring around Australia with one, probably about, oh, there you go. about sure seven years ago or something now. Uh, I was yeah. playing in a Queen tribute show. Uh, wow. And yeah, people would just freak out at how good it sounded. Um, and I've been looking around for a rig to do these shows, like I said, with the 80s guys coming up. Uh, but there's no Kempers in Australia right now. The shipment's still coming. And I, I bought a Soldano preamp a couple of days ago. Oh, wow. I'm looking what forward to incorporating that, let me tell you. Yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, Phil, I'm actually going to jump back just a little and yeah. ask you the question because you're talking about working in the music store and everything. And yeah. what I want to know is what initially started the love affair with the guitar? Well, interesting. I think really the, the truthful answer to that is that my brother was playing uh, and he sort of, I think he started on, a, on electric guitar. I never remember. My brother's name's Ashley. He's two years older than me. He lives in Perth. Uh, he's a great guitar player too. And But I don't remember him ever playing a classical guitar maybe he did but anyway all i remember is he had this beautiful well to me it was beautiful actually it was a canora do you remember canora i don't know if you even remember those i have like, I, I have seen those yeah yeah um you know in these these days you know we know that it wasn't such a great guitar but to me it was you know this beautiful sunburst thing and you know uh, 
and he had uh, it was at the age I think it was about because I was 13 when I started playing guitar um, he was actually we had a bungalow we built this bungalow in the backyard of our house uh, and we because I think our, our uncle was going to stay there or something but that didn't happen so what happened was my brother moved out of our room because you know there was, there was the two of us in the one room and he had the bungalow and that was you know and, and he kind of converted that into his cave you know he had like incense burning and it was all dark and he had he had a oh what was the name of the he had this old valve amplifier um, they're actually collector's items now. I can't remember the name, but anyway, uh, oh, it'll come to me. Um, and so you walk in there and there'd be incense burning and there'd be Hendrix kind of playing. So that really must have been like 66, I reckon, 1966, 1967. And it was like walking into another world, you know, it was very, very cool. Uh, so of course, you know, he, he, he was playing the guitar, so maybe I should play the guitar, you know? Yeah. Um, so talk my, talk my mum into it. And, and it was kind of just starting then, you know, you'd imagine the, the sixties, it's Beatles. It's, you know, it was an incredible era for music. Um, it was Dylan, it was, you know, amazing stuff happening. Um, and we were, you know, because he was interested in music, I was interested in, in, in music. My sister had all the Beatles records, so I, I was listening to that stuff. Um, so anyway, I taught my parents and at school it was happening. The kids were starting to get guitars, mainly just uh, nylon string acoustic guitars because that was, you know, they were cheap and, you know, so I talked my mum into it because somebody let me a guitar to have one string on it, just had the E string on it, just a nylon string guitar with E string on it. And I brought it home. I said, mum, look, I can play Zorba the Greek. And I just did that, you know, and she was like, wow. And so that convinced her. Cool. Uh, yep. Yeah. And um, so she did. And I remember the, the day my sister came home with her because I was waiting at the window and, and, and my sister got off the bus. She got, got home from work. She worked at an insurance company or something. And she, you know, she walked up the drive and I could see she had this box under her arm, you know. And uh, so I had my first guitar and it was just a nylon string. I think it was 25 quid or something or 25 bucks or something. And to me, though, it was like, yeah, this is, this is great. And uh, so I started learning chords and stuff like that. Um, I don't think I was a really fast learner or anything like that. It wasn't like I just picked it up and started playing. Um, it was, um, you know, I had the Nick Mandeloff Coles method. This is, you know, trying to learn how to play music and all that sort of stuff. But the good thing be was before that, I, I, I had seen Stevie Wonder on the TV doing, I think he was doing um, probably My Sharia Moore or something, somewhere where, where he played the harmonica. And I knew that that's not a normal harmonica, what mm. he's playing. I saw the button on the end of it. Yeah. And I convinced my mum to get me one of those. I'd seen one in a music store in Melbourne in the front window, and I thought, I've got to get one of those. Wow. Because that's what Wonders got, right? Yeah. And the, but the beauty of that was it came with a little book called the Easy Chromatic Harmonica Method, right? Yeah. And it was a system, because on the harmonica, there were all these numbers, and some of them had circles, some of them didn't, I think. And the ones that had circles were the ones where you press the button or something. I don't know. I can't remember. But the book showed you that number, number five, is this note here on the staff. And I'm looking at the staff. I'd never seen a you know, music staff. And that taught me that when I blowed that note, I was playing that when I blowed that number, I was playing that note. So this was a, a way of kind of learning. And the first thing I did, of course, was write a, write a tune because I could write the notes down because I knew that the numbers. Now, I didn't know what the timing was. That didn't matter. Um, so when I got the guitar, it was kind of, there were the notes again. Um, and I could kind of understand. But this time it was, you know, relating it to the fretboard kind of thing. And what was the first thing I did? I wrote a song, <laughs> you know, uh, this little tune, uh, and, you know, which was, pretty pretty crap but it was a little bit experimental i got to say this little tune yeah and then i was able to actually work out on the guitar what the notes were because of that easy chromatic method and i still I still was using that book and going backwards and forwards and i wrote this little thing out in music and i and this was i think i was in third grade or something i took it to school and in our in our class there was a piano and our t every now and again our teacher would play the piano so i took this bit of music up to her and said can you play that and so, you know, in front of the whole class, she played this tune. Went for about five seconds. It was just, nah, 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 yeah. nah, nah. but to have to get something from out of your head onto a bit of paper, give it to someone else, and have them play it, and for the whole class to hear it, some sort of connection happened. I think. Wow. Uh, it was like this is. I think probably even though I didn't say it to myself, but that was like, okay, this is what you're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> it's written, you know, this, this is what's going to happen. So um, that's kind of where the love affair with the guitar started because it was that um, that thing of, I'm listening to the Beatles because my sister's playing it in, 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 her, in, in her room. I'm hearing the guitars. 
I'm trying to figure out what they're doing. And then it begins, you know, like so many other guitar players will tell you, trying to figure out what they're doing, how to make it sound like that, how to get those chord changes happening. But also at the same time, um, I was actually writing songs. I was actually making up these little things because I thought that's what it's about. You know, you yep. make up your own thing. You don't. Yep. Um, and and I don't know why, but that's that's the way I kind of started. So I'd hear things on TV, and then I'd run into my room and try and work it out. So you st you know the, the the development of the ear was was kind of starting. You know, yep. um, I think it was trying to put it into uh, some sort of terms. It was like you would see something on TV that would affect you like this, this sound coming out of that magical thing, that TV thing. And it's like, it sounds corny trying to put it into words, but what you were trying to, what I was trying to do was, I got, I got to have that, that, that way that it made me feel that little bit of magic. I can go into my room and try and, and maybe get a little bit of that. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you, you just want to be in that, you want to stay in that world. It's like when a, when a show that's on that you love, um, suddenly finishes and the TV goes off. It's like, I want to, I want to be back in that world. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I think that's all I was trying to do was to recreate that thing with the guitar, you know, by trying to figure out what other people were doing and, uh, and to try and see if I could sort of get that feeling. And I think it stayed the same, really. That's been my MO for the whole time. It, I really didn't start out listening to guitar solos. I, I, um, that maybe started when I was a teenager. But it was always about writing a song, um, yeah. coming up with my own little piece. Well, that's uh, that's quite young to start writing your own music. That, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, and you know, have gone on to to write some some classic Australian songs as well. But um, you said that just the the you didn't start playing lead guitar uh, until no. a little later. No. Um, and man, I I, I got to say, um, I, I was a big fan of, of you and Jack back in the day. Um, watching you guys like Southern Suns was known as you know sort of a, a mainstream pop act, but I'd always yep. rock up early to hear you guys sound check because I would just hear you guys just wailing, man, and people wouldn't believe me. I'm going, dude, no, you got to you got to hear these guys; they're amazing. And uh, you, you guys would, you know, towards the end of the set, maybe you know, let it loose a bit. But there was one um, the MTV basement thing, and you guys are playing "Make a Move" and. And Make a move, Jack yeah. are, are trading solos there, and man, that, that that's amazing. And so, what when you started playing lead guitar? Like, who who were the guys that got you started into that? Um, if I really really go back, the the first things I was trying to work out was Johnny Winter. Uh, so now I'm I, I would say I'm fifteen sixteen by this stage. We'd moved from one suburb to another suburb, which is a much nicer suburb, although we didn't know at the time. Um, and my brother, I think it was my brother that had the Johnny Winter record. I don't know which one it was. I think it was just called Johnny Winter. It was the one with his face just on the cover. That's it, just his face on the cover. And I still had my little nylon string guitar. Um, and I could not, I, I was trying to figure out what he was doing, but what I didn't know was that he was bending strings. And of course, you couldn't bend strings on the nylon string. No, and I didn't no. even know what bending string was anyway. Um, you know, once again, we have to remind everyone that there was no internet, there was no YouTube video that you could go and watch and really uh, it was a pretty isolated kind of a life i mean you know it was just get up go to school come home um had very few friends because i just changed school um it was just trying to figure out stuff from the record so really i'd just come from um i was really into dylan and Joni mitchell when i when i grew up uh, dylan because my sister had given me a birthday present and the birthday present, I think it was a combined present or something. It was Rolling Stones, High Tide and Green Grass, which is the Rolling Stones' greatest hits. And then Bob Dylan's greatest hits. All right. So I had those two records. Now, the Dylan thing just got me. I was like gone. You know, because, but here's the funny thing, Rick. When you're growing up, I mean, I didn't know about charts or anything. I didn't know about number one songs. But I mean, you'd hear about, oh, the Beatles had no number one record, whatever that meant. You know, I didn't know there was a chart. There was no book you could read or... No magazine that you didn't, you know, you just, I can't believe how ignorant we were. I didn't realize that Bob Dylan's, I didn't know what greatest hits meant. Bob, I just thought, wow, this album's got so many great songs. Yeah, on yeah, it. right. Classic. <laughs> it, it didn't dawn on me. It's yep. years later when I saw uh, an album that had some of those songs on it. 
but it wasn't that album. I thought, how come this album's got the same songs on it? And they, of course, that was the album that these songs, you know, it had been taken from a whole, he'd been yeah. around for years. I didn't know, I thought he was brand new. Bob, this is a new artist. And he's got all these songs. <laughs> it's probably, uh, he's been going for like five years or something. But yeah. it's the same thing with the Rolling Stones. I didn't realize that's a greatest hits record. I didn't know they'd been around for that long. Yeah. Um, but I was much more attracted to the Dylan thing than I was the Rolling Stones thing. There was once, there was a couple of songs from the Rolling Stones things that I dug. But anyway, um, I've gone off the completely gone off the track, but I wasn't really working out any anything to do with uh, solo guitar. What I was working out though was all these finger patterns, all the Dylan stuff. Um, uh, uh, when uh, when I got a little bit older, my sister started getting Peter Paul and Mary records and stuff. It was all this folk stuff, and I even went to a folk club. Uh, went to a you know we'd go to these folk cafes where you know people would just get up and sing their song. So I was definitely into the whole singer song writer thing. Uh, I eventually ended up with my harmonica holder, tried to find a cap just like Bob Dylan. You know, you just emulate your, your, your heroes kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and and I, I mentioned before about Ross Fraser. I mean, he, he was the guy that brought around the first Joni Mitchell album for me. And you wouldn't think that by this stage, I must be 15, 16, maybe even 17. You know, year, year five, we would have called it um, fifth form, which is a year 11 or something now. Um, you wouldn't think that a... a you know, a, a young teenage boy, you know, full of testosterone and, you know, anger and rebellion uh, would be listening to Joni Mitchell. But there was something about Joni and something about the softer songs of Dylan that would just would really get to me. I don't know. It just I was drawn to that big time um, and especially Joni's lyrics. You know, I just used to think, how can you think of things like that to say? You're, you know, because it, once again, you're ignorant. You haven't got the internet. You don't even know. Like, she's Canadian. I don't even. I don't know where Canada was, for heaven's sake. I had no idea what that country was or what you know her, her background. There was. No, I didn't know any stories about her or anything. Um, I'd read a book about Bob Dylan, so I knew a little bit of, uh, about him. So it was more trying to find out about the style of. Where do these songs come from? How, what, you know, I didn't know anything about the folk tradition and stuff like that. You, later on, you kind of learn that stuff. So it's all this beautiful mystery. I think that's part of the beauty of, of music, I think. when And I'm glad it stayed mysterious for a long time. I reckon that made a big difference for me. Um, because you're not dealing with facts. You're dealing with all these kind of mythological kind of things. And, and you make gods out of these people. You really do, you know. But, you know, at the same time, you would know that, of course, there was Hendrix going. I mean, I remember lying in bed and hearing um, Foxy Lady for the first time, you know, through our Valve radio. And just going, what the hell is that? So it was like, bang! I'm drawn to that. Remember lying in bed and hearing um, all along the watchtower coming from uh, my mum's radio in the kitchen, and just, oh my god, what's that? Dun 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 dun. It was just like someone just opened up a big door. Wow! <laughs> you know? Wow! And so that part of me was starting to come awake, you know. But I still hadn't. By the time I was. 16 i still did not have electric guitar i still was just i'd sort of gone up to a steel string acoustic guitar i could play lots of guitar all that complicated finger pattern stuff i was really into that i worked out angie from is it angie from the, the simon and garfunkel record it was which was really quite quite well reasonably complex i'd already worked out classical gas just from listening to the record nice i started to work out some segovia stuff. i mean i really had gone crazy with working out stuff you know being able to put the, the needle on the record at, at, right at the right place kind of thing um and then you know for some strange reason when i used to when i you know, had enough pocket money if i had any pocket money um i would i would buy a record so i, I would try and get whatever the latest bob dylan record was or, or whatever when i used to go to the record store they used to have you know just have the cheap bins you know the bargain, yep. bargain bins and in the bargain bin i found a george benson record and I'd, i've heard it i'd heard of this guy yeah uh, and it was called benson burner it's a double album and it was it is him when he's about 20 19 or 20 and I wow. just, so i bought and i took it home and i was like what the hell is this I <laughs> So that was my first introduction to the to the jazz thing. Because of that, next time I was in that record shop, I got a I got a Wes Montgomery record, really really cheap, and that was like a almost like a greatest hits record. It was before he started doing just the octave stuff. It was when he was you know he was doing the jazz standards, and so at even at that early age, I'd started listening to that stuff, and I was really digging it. Uh, but it it, it was um, it was very hard to work that stuff out. I didn't know what it was based on. I, I couldn't quite understand it. Only that's how you later. come up with your own style, isn't it? That's it. You know, yeah. you do 
you chase these little things, you know, you, you, th there's just certain elements about that music that you love, but you know, one has to remember looking back on it, that we, we are not America, you know, we are not the USA, um, where that music was born. I mean, you know, that bo the rock and roll was born in America from black musicians. Um, jazz was born in America from black musicians. Uh, I didn't know any of that. Nothing. I mean, I knew that, you know, Wes and, and George Benson were, were black artists, but you didn't know that they invented that stuff because there was nowhere to read about it. You just knew they played this incredible stuff. Um, we, but we, what I'm trying to put into words is Australia to me in those days, because we didn't have the internet, it was kind of like a satellite, you know, you had America and to a degree, uh, obviously England or Europe in general. And we were like, just kind of circling it, grabbing these little bits out of it. But we weren't it. We were not where it was beginning. We were getting everything secondhand uh, in, in as much as, you know, on, on a delay kind of thing. Our radio was as all radio stations were in those days, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, but our radio stations were run by, you know, people who needed advertising, who were being influenced by uh, what was happening overseas, probably also being influenced by uh, record companies and their affiliates in this country who were, you know, not bribing them, but, you know, you've got to play this track because this is blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And we know how it used to work in, in the old days. We were hearing what were, was being fed to us, you know, um, it could, could never happen again. I mean, we, we, we were, how could you put it? We were uh, canaries in the, well, no, we, we never got to hear, for example, I've discovered artists that were around in the 70s that I, now I've discovered them that are, we never heard of. They just never got played on radio because yeah. there's only a certain amount of stuff they could play. Uh, and even um, singles from really well-known bands, you know, um, I remember being in, uh, I spent six months in England in, in 2015, working at a studio there and I go home at night and there's so much music on, uh, on, on TV in England. I mean, you can just listen to concerts. You can, I mean, every night there's some great music thing on, uh, which, you know, obviously doesn't happen here. Uh, you're surrounded by music all the time. And I, I was watching Top of the Pops and I, you know, it's great because it takes you right back to those days and they'd, they'd be showing all the old ones, you know, where the kinks were on and, and, and right through the eighties and the, the, and you'd hear a band that you knew really well and you knew their hit and they'd do another song and you go, I've never, never heard of that. Yep. And that was yep. a hit. Mm -hmm. That was a huge hit in England. They just didn't play it here. And that's just, I mean, so we'd missed out on that. We, we were fed a certain style of thing. Um, and, it, and thank God for the internet, you know, as much as people complain about it, really, I love the internet because it just opened up. I mean, I only heard about Borelli Legren, one of the greatest guitarists in the world, about six or seven years ago. I mean, my God, he's been around forever. You just missed out on all that, you know. I have to write it's that like, down. Who's this chap? Oh, this guy called Borelli Legren. Uh, he's spelled B I R E. Double L I, I think. I think Borelli. If yeah. you just type that, it'll come up. Yep. He's okay. like the 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 one of the top five gypsy jazz kind of players. I mean, I I knew about um, Django because I bought one of those records. So I had a Django. I had a couple of Django Reinhardt records actually. Yep. But I can't believe when I first saw him, I was like, oh, what? <laughs> it was like, anyway. Um, uh, so yeah, we were Australia was a satellite, and we were only fed. You know, and I'm not saying that like, oh, they were just feeding us all. Not at yeah. all. There's only a certain amount they could sort of get to us. And, you know, um, so our, our um, the songs that we grew up with were, you know, a selected kind of amount of songs that wasn't everything that was around at the time. Um, so, um, so when it, but the good thing about it was, I, I don't know why it happened this way, Rick, but there were certain records that I bought that were like, really freaking important records and I only bought them kind of by accident and there are other things that happened too that were just a fluke like um because I was into Dylan so I'm into that whole there's something about that whole folk one guy and a guitar and he's singing about you know these really seem, seemingly important things and big things in life and all this sort of you know, answer my friend is blown in the wind and the times are a change and these were big things of course you didn't understand it really but you knew that it was you connected to something that was kind of important to the zeitgeist or whatever it might be yeah. in a in a strange little australian way um but um 
there were so I'm listening to Dylan and for some reason I pick up this book um, called is it called On the Road by Jack Kerouac and this is like a seminal really important book for the whole beat generation of which I really wasn't a part of because that was a little bit younger that'd be more like you know late 50s into early 60s kind of thing but here's this guy um, you know talking about just uh, you know hitching rides on on, on, on the railway and, and just you know going out in the road like a tramp kind of thing meeting people it's like man I just got lost in that book and it's only later on you find that this is one of the seminal books of that this you have to read this book this is really important I don't know how I got it but somehow I got I did read that book um, to kill a mockingbird that would made a huge impression on me as a young young fella um, so it's not just um, the music it's also the the literature uh, sort of at the time um, having those kind of effects but I eventually got an electric guitar when I was probably about 17 I think and it was I don't know how my mum afforded it because we were poor I mean we were we were poor when I say poor I mean poor yeah. my dad worked in the factory my mum mum worked in factories somehow mum you know she knew that I was into the into music and my brother was into it and somehow she would put stuff those were the days when you could put stuff on lay by and she'd be she'd you know have these little things I'd beg her for a guitar and somehow she would get it you know I had a Gibson SG. I mean, that's that's really saying something. But that's probably back in the days when they were like five hundred bucks or something. One of the most standard sort of Gibsons. But still, yeah. you know, I didn't even know how good it was because that I, was your I first guitar, a, the SG. That was the first electric. I mean, I mucked around on my brother's. He had some, um, um, you know, cheap Korean or Japanese or Chinese kind of guitars. But he eventually got a Gibson three thirty five. I think he was working then. No, three forty five. He was working then. Um, uh, so you know he had, he had some sort of money of his own but we started we started a, uh, um, I started to play electric guitar but I still I still I, I don't know what I was doing I, I'd been influenced a lot by because in in the early days my brother used to play the cream records you know especially wheels of fire and there was something about that crossroads track that got me you know isn't it funny how it, you know now you find out everybody loved that track but yeah <laughs> it was like because it's good. That's why. It's, it's yeah. funny how it can affect different people. There's no one telling you you got to listen to this because it's really great. No one's saying it's great. You discover that it's great because you just keep going back and listening to it. You know, yeah. It's uh, this self. You can tell when something is good. It affects you. It's like something. And, uh, and I was old enough then to think about it's his phrasing. It's the the space between the notes. You know, because on the one hand I had Johnny Winter who was like a million miles an hour and really that blues thing and. He was very um, flashy, you know, in a rough kind of a way, Johnny Winter. Uh, a lot, and there was a lot of passion in his playing, but a lot of speed. But Clapton wasn't doing that in the early days, you know, with Cream, when he had the 35 or the Firebird and the Marshall sound, when he had the Brown sound, you know. That's why they call him Slow Hand. Exactly. And I used, and that really made an impression on me. I think he's, he's phrasing. It's, uh, it's, he's got these spaces and he's, he's kind of talking and... Uh, and uh, that's what I want to do. You know, the, whatever he's doing, I want to do it. Um, so then, then the the whole playing in bands thing kind of started uh, in a very strange way. Because I, you know, once again, I was writing songs, so I wanted to play these songs that I, that, that I was writing. Cool. Pretty, so from the start, no, no cover band. You were straight into playing your I've own songs, huh? Yeah. Well, there's actually there's. I think one of my friends is watching who I did play in a cover band. With. I did a stint in a. It's kind of like a wedding band of all things when i when i was a bit older probably i don't know 20 21 22. um uh, i'd never played in a cover band before and that was a great experience for me i think i played with the guys for about six months or maybe it was a year or something but i had to learn a, a whole bunch of songs and i'd never you know at least they, they were playing the usual stuff of the day the, the popular bands you know the eagles and billy joel and all this sort of stuff and uh, i'd never done that you know, i'd never had to work out of the chord but just by doing that be like oh Look at these chords Billy's using, you know. <laughs> or look at the chord. How, how come the Eagles sound so good when it's just G, C, and what the hell, you know? These are really simple chords, but they're making it sound good. So, from a, a songwriting point of view, that was interesting to me. That you didn't need to, um, you know, you, you could do it different ways. You could either have a whole bunch of interesting chords, or you didn't need to if you had a great melody and great harmonies and all this sort of stuff. All this stuff is kind of learning stuff. Um, but yeah, before that, I never played in a cover band. Even the state, I remember having a rehearsal with the state and, and one of the guys in the band saying, this is before even, uh, was Virgil? No, Virgil wasn't in the band then. This is before Virgil. And one of the guys saying, look, we got to do a cover, man. You know, you know, we got, we got to have one cover because people will think you're up yourself. You know, you got to, you know, you're not paying respect to anyone else's music. So I'm like, oh, 
right, what should we do? <laughs> One of the guys <laughs> said, um, I, I really want to do Born to Run by, by um, um, Springsteen. Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. I mean, I had that record because, you know, because I always thought Bruce was in those days, well, even before Born to Run, he was a singer songwriter, you know, is that once again drawn to that kind of thing. And so we tried to play that. <laughs> Freaking laughable. The, what, I think what I'm trying to point out is we were, well, I was not part of that um, thing. I, I was never part of, I think. The, the older I get, the more I realize that I, and I think a lot of people will say this, it's, you know, it's nothing, it's nothing that individual or special, but you felt, felt like you didn't fit into anything. You, re I remember, I can even go, um, I remember once I had, I might, I might mention names, but I remember one of the guys in the band, when, when we were doing gigs, you know, I remember playing the corner hotel and, and one of the guys in the band said, fuck, I wish we had a song, excuse the language, I wish we had a song like Bloody Noise Works, you know, fuck, and that's great, you know. And I just felt this emptiness inside me. It was like, I'm not like that. I can't, there's no big voice like that. There's, I don't want to do, you know, stuff like that. I mean, they do it great, good on them, you know, but I want to do these different weird, wacky chords. And I, but I remember it hitting me hard. It was like this, this thing of, you've got to be like everybody else. You've got to compete. You've got to, you know, they're doing that stuff. You've got to, and, in, and we'd go and see bands like that. And I remember seeing In Excess too. And just looking at the band going, Obviously, they're world famous, but I'm not that. Whatever he's doing, I'm not that. Yeah. But is it still in the state? The same, is it still uh, in the state it's days? Still in the state, yeah. Yep. And this, uh, and I remember, but but what's happening is you're comparing yourself and going, "We're shit. We can't do that." I mean, look, those guys look like gods. I mean, listen to the sound of it. Listen to look at their PA. Look at the gear they've got. I mean. We're just nothing. We're shit. But you'd have those moments, but then you'd rally and you'd go, no, fuck this, man. I'm going to do it my own way. I don't care. You, you can be powerful with uh, something that doesn't have to look like that. You don't have to be jumping around like that. You, there's power in music. If you can find a way of doing it, you will do it, you know. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, but they're great learning experience. They're great growing things when you're crushed like that, you know. Uh, it was like when um, our manager used to. We, I remember just before the state got signed, when we were trying, I was trying to get a record deal, something shocking. Um, it, it was like the hardest thing in the bloody world. I mean, I, I mentioned um, you know the guys from um, Real Life coming into the shop and and uh, you know other bands that had been signed, and just thinking they were they were almost like on this other divide. They were like on the other. There was this big val, this big cliff. And they were standing on the other side in the good place and you were on the other side, not in the good place. You know, they, they'd done something that you, and there was this, this, you know, and I don't mind admitting there was this jealousy and kind of, how do they do it? You know, I'm nothing unless I, you know, you, they're always self doubt, you know, because all musicians are like that. There's always this crushing self doubt that, uh, that accompanies you, you know? Um, but I tell you what, to cut a long story short, um, to not turn into a philosophy, but, this thing of sticking with the thing that you believe in, the, 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 the one thing that you do different or the things that you do different to anybody else that don't line up with the mainstream, that make, make you, that's the important thing. That's the thing, the thing that makes you different. You know, yeah. that's, um, that's, that's, your, that's your stock in trade. You know, why? <laughs> um, anyway. Um, but you, you don't know that at the time, you just keep trying and trying. And I remember when Peter used to, we, I remember we had a tape of really the, the first date album and Peter took that tape around. He would go up to Sydney, um, probably drive. Um, and he would ring me he, he, he would go and see record companies and he would go and see radio stations and whoever else. And he would ring me every night and I'd get the phone call and there'd be just kind of silence. I'd say, Pete, what's, what's happening, man? How'd you go, man? What, you know, cause I was excited, you know, he's playing our songs to record companies. Yeah. And the first thing he would say, cause the first thing he would say was don't give up your day gig. And fair dinkum, that I just, my body would just go. <laughs> cause it was once again, you failed. Mm. They, they don't like it. They, they can't hear it. You're not like any of the other bands on the radio. Um, you know, they want, uh, they want something that's like such and such an artist who's, you know, uh, doing something and, um, you know, you, you're not that, you know, 
But Peter believed in the band. He was hurt as much as I was hurt. It would kill him. He was crushed. It, he was almost, it was nervous breakdown time. I mean, I'm making it sound really dramatic, but it was because there was nothing else in our life. This was it. We had, to, we worked all this time to get a deal. This was it. We'd done our best. This time, at this stage, Virgil was in the band, even though the poor bugger had to play drums with his fingers on that album because I had a, I had an SB12. We didn't have a studio. You know? Yeah, I did realise it mostly drum machine on that album, except the yep. last track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so... Uh, and so we just kept getting knocked back and knocked back and it was it, there was no there was no respite from it it was just complete failure you know and uh uh i remember I, I, this this would be now when i'm you know kind of in my 20s we're, we're, this is just before the suns i mean i've jumped a lot it's too too much boring stuff that's okay mate. Um, um i remember and i only realized it in hindsight now that i was breaking down um you know we had different members in the band and I try to please everybody. I was one of those guys that tried to, I wasn't one of those guys that was like, no, we're just going to do this. And that's what we're doing. You know, if you don't like it, piss off. I was, I was too accommodating. You know? Yeah. I was trying to please everybody and do, can we just be nice? Can, do we, we don't need to fight. Can we just not, not probably the right personality to be, be heading a band, you know, to try and keep everybody happy. Uh, and, and at the same time there, we were doing all my songs. And so, you know, it also, you can get to a situation where some of the other members might go, well, it's just shit. You know, you, it's not working. It's shit, you know, and suddenly you're nothing again. You're just crushed again, you know, Yeah. Uh, but you have to rally again, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, I, I just want to point out how low you can go. I, I mean, I, I was doing these things at night when I go to bed, particularly when Peter was out up doing, you know, trying to, trying to get some interest from record companies. I would, I didn't realize that, that I had a problem. But apart from having terrible stomach problems, really, really bad. Um, but I, every night I would had this routine where I turn the lights off in the house. This is so weird where I'd flick the lights, um, at a certain, a certain way It had to be, it was one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. So there was a, a bar of five in there, mind you. Um, and if I didn't flick the light off that way, I'd stop, reset, do it again. If I could, didn't get it perfect in such a way that it went one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, I'd do it again. Wow. And I'd do that to every, every light in the house before I could go to bed. So this was some sort of... Like an OCD uh, thing creeping in yeah, there. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was. Um, you know, it, and I think all that, it's trying to be an amateur psychologist. I think all that stuff is based on if you get it right, something good will happen. If you get it wrong, something bad's going to happen. So you've got to get it right. It's all this weird. I was really on it. I remember saying to my friend, my lifelong friend, who, li who lived next door to us then, we're in, in the in the little flat we were living in. I said to him, "This doesn't work. I don't know what I'm going to do. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Um, you know, because I'd worked in factories, I'd worked in road gangs, worked in a music shop. I hadn't, you know, I had no skills other than I can play this guitar, you know, and yep. I think I can write songs, you know." Yep. Um, and then, you know, we got signed. God damn it. And that was, and guess who signed us? Ross Fraser. Ross Fraser. There you go. There Full circle. Yeah. Exactly. So Ross was at this time now working for BMG, which is, you know, the Bertelsmann Music Group, um, who are no longer at it. No, BMG is still, of course, they're still there. One of my good friends works there. Um, and so Ross was, he was looking for talent. And I think he'd signed... Did he sign Richard Pleasance by then? He, Richard was the guitar player from Boom Crash. Boom Crash yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and Ross was one of those guys, he he really believed in me, which was pretty amazing because no one else did, apart from Peter, my manager. I don't think anyone else did. Um, he believed in me, you know, which was pretty bloody amazing. And uh, he, he, he loved the state record and he signed it. You know, he, he uh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so, did you re-record that album, or was no? no that was just the demos. Well, we and just got yes, it mastered. We did it in the bedroom on a Fostex eight track, and um, there used to be this program called. I had an Atari. This is before Mac. Before Max, I didn't have a Mac there. No, it was before yep. Max. Ten forty um, STE. Yeah, Atari ten forty. Yep. yep, I had one of those yep. back in the eighties yep. myself. So I had Master Track Pro, which 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 could generate a SMPTE code, which means on one track, on the outside track of the little Fostex eight track, I could record a SMPTE. Um, stripe it with simty and then i could stop 
I could stop the tape and the freaking computer would stop at the right place and start at the right yep. place. This was big time. Yep. Now, this is what the SP-12, the drum machine, was running off, you know. Yep. <laughs> Poor old Verge. Jesus. <laughs> uh, imagine <laughs> a drum like that in the band. And he, but, you know, he stuck, and he was in the band long before that too, man. He stuck, he believed in me too. So I, I think these are the, the people who get you through this stuff, you know. Um, he heard the band one night. Um, he was playing with Tommy Emmanuel, and I remember we did the, the big, big beer barn in Melbourne called the Village Green, and uh, and this and the, the cutter. In those days, it was the cutters before the state. Um, we did, uh, uh, you know, the what do they call it? First band, support band, kind of thing. And Virgil heard the songs, and these are really early songs, man, really early songs. And he came up to me, and and. Uh, uh, he said hello, and I think that was the first time I met Virgil. And it wasn't long after that that, that, that Peter, our manager, said, oh, I got a phone call from Virgil Donati, you know, he knows you're looking for a drummer and he wants to audition. And I said, what? Virgil Donati? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and so, yeah, and so Virgil's in the band, you know, and, and people don't know it, but Virgil's a great keyboard player. And so I remember you always used to play synth at the side yeah, of his kit when I go see you guys play. That's yep. cool. He can play bloody rack man enough. I mean, Virgil's the guy, yep. and I mean, yep. so he would come around and he wouldn't play drums. He we'd be programming synthesizers. That's what we'd be doing when we yep. when Virgil was around. Um, and you know, he'd do all the backing tracks for the for the. He's got a really good ear for that sort of stuff. And so yeah, so uh, Ross finally signed the band, and it, it, you know, it was with a it was a full recording contract with BMG, and it was like, oh my god, this is fantastic. And then of course, you know, it wasn't a hit. We didn't, it, it, you know, I didn't, I didn't really know what. I hadn't come from that world of hits, you know. It was like what I didn't realize was, uh, looking back on it now, is that you, you've joined a, you, you've signed with a record company. They're a pop record company. They're going to want pop songs from you. Yeah. I just thought, well, they signed us because they loved us, and we're going to keep doing what we keep doing. But then came the first thing: oh, you need a single for this album. I hadn't written was that, what was the song I wrote? Real love. I hadn't written that yet. And uh, uh, no, hang on a sec. No, 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 no. Of course, that was all done. That, that did I have to? I think we had to add that song to it from memory. It's too long ago. Um, they wanted a single, so I had to do this. This I wrote this song called Real. And then, of course, that was the first time you could almost say that this is the first time where um, instead of just doing exactly wanted, what I wanted to do, I was acquiescing to the record company. Um, and that's a, when I look back on it, I had no problems doing that. No, yep. I wasn't coerced. It was like, oh, you want me to write a hit song? Okay, well, so we yep. need a catchy, yeah, well, I'll try and do that. But I wasn't doing that before. You know, I wasn't, I was just writing whatever I wanted to write. And the weirder, the better. You know, check out this chord. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, and you can hear some of the tracks on that first album. I've got some, and I, I was also using tunings and stuff on the on that album. But then pops up this one song, you know, Real Love is like a real kind of... Um, anyway, they were happy with that, and so we went with that as the first single. And of course, I think it just sounded so bad, or maybe it wasn't the right time, or whatever. We just couldn't get any traction with that track. Um, I remember we went on, you know, we went on TV and everything. I think we even went on. Hey, we do you guys have Hey Hey It's Saturday up there? Was it of course we did. Yep, was yep, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I remember seeing you doing a promo for for uh, that, and it was uh, yep. John Owen Dano. They had the music oh, show yeah. in the morning. I remember you being interviewed on there. Yeah. yeah. With the hair, <laughs> but yeah, you had the the bit hanging down, yeah. and yeah, yeah. By this stage, they'd taken us to, um, uh, you know, our manager was very stylish, kind of a guy. His he, him and his partners were running nightclubs in in Melbourne, so he's quite connected with that whole uh, world of art and something that I wasn't connected to because I'd come from the suburbs, the really really poor suburbs of Melbourne. I was just a bogan, basically, still am really. Uh, but he introduced me to all that, the other side of life, you know, which I never knew about, you know. He'd take us to these nightclubs and we'd sit there and was like, what is happening? Yeah. What The lights, the people dancing and all sorts. I didn't, you know, didn't even know it existed, but they had, and, and a lot of people, it was a stage when a lot of people were really dressed up and I was, I was sort of being introduced to this world of fashion in a way, which had nothing to do with me, but I was interested in it. It was like... Yeah. This is another world. This is like getting on a spaceship, you know. I yeah. wouldn't mind having part of this. So that's when, if you go back and look at some of the early state days, you start to see we're starting to dress up a bit, and we've got some sort of '80s kind of blousy shirts. On yeah, and yeah, stuff. yeah. And then they got some designers for us, and they actually made clothes for us. Like the, if you look at the cover of the state album, it's like all those clothes are handmade for us. 
And I remember one reviewer saying, which actually really hurt at the time, she said, she listened, she, she gave a review of the State album and she said, one day these boys will look at the cover of this album and and, yeah, and, and realize what a mistake they made. Or I'm going to like. find that album cover. I have it on tape in there. I'm going to ask yeah. you a question, Phil, and I'm going to yeah. duck off just for 30 seconds, like I said would happen after too many coffees. I'm going to shut that yep. door because it's getting a bit cold. Um, yep. So you, you're talking about the state. You, you were mentioning before that you're into Clapton and these kinds of guys. Yep. Man, the state record has quite shreddy guitar player on, playing yep. on there. You know, like how did you get from Clapton to the state where you're, yeah, man, all over it. Just, how did that happen? I reckon. And I'll, I'll come start- back. Keep keep talking. Yeah. Uh, I, I reckon we could probably start with uh, Brett Garset. Uh, I remember I said to you that, you know, I'd heard Brett in the music shop. And in fact, Ross Fraser, because Brett had sent a tape to a Ross Fraser um, just because Brett had done this uh, tape of his songs and he was looking for some, some sort of work or something. And, it, and Ross had listened to it and um, auditioned him for John Farnham's band. So um, Ross had a tape, that, that particular tape, and he gave it to me. I don't, I don't know if Brett knows that. And so I had a tape of Brett Garcett, you know, doing all this legato stuff and a lot of chromatic stuff Brett was doing in those days, Te- uh, techniques and a style that I really hadn't heard, even though I'd heard Holdsworth, this was kind of different. Brett was doing his own thing. It was more more of a rock and roll kind of thing that Brett was doing. Now, I didn't, uh, I didn't really sit down and start working that stuff out because, I mean, I'd seen Brett play, so I could see his hands. I could kind of see what he was doing. And I knew it was, you know, all the hammering on and the, and the legato thing. I remember thinking, do I want to go down that track? But of course, it sounded so good to me that I thought, I've got to, I've got to find out what the hell he's doing. So um, I did start working out some of that stuff. I worked out some of the, particularly some of the chromatic stuff he was doing. Um, so that's kind of where it started, probably with Brett. And then at the same time, it wasn't long before Melmsteam kind of came out. And of course, I was working in the shop by then. We had all the tapes they used to have, what are they called the what are they remember the blue tapes that used to come out by some company used to make uh, hot licks i think it was hot oh yeah licks, yeah something. the video tapes yep yep R- yeah. reh and hot R- licks and, that's it yep reh yeah yep. and of course I, I took that um i took that one home, the the melmstein one home and i thought that's kind of cool what he's doing uh i thought his technique is really good i've got to find out how he's getting that you know he's he's he, he's up and down picking is really really cool i kind of like that I hate to say it, but I, I was drawn to that more than the legato thing. There's something, I, and I still do it. I, I mean, I, I do very little legato these days. Um, you, pr- you probably heard me doing the legato stuff in that uh, the MTV basement tapes yeah, when I was doing that. Things. But also kind of almost like hybrid picking thing where it was like you were doing yeah. sweep arpeggios with yeah. your fingers, yeah. yeah, which is just so wild. I at, yeah, I looked at all that stuff and 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 – uh, but I, I preferred the picking thing. There's something about the pick hit and the string that I love. I'm just one of those guys, you know. I love the I love the legato thing too. I love the way Holdsworth does it. Um, but all the jazz guys that I was, listen, I was listening to, they weren't using any sustain or distortion. They were just using, you know, particularly Benson, really clean picking. And it's, there's something that excites me. There's a lot of energy I get from that sort of thing. So that's kind of where that started. So, you know, I was listening to Holdsworth. I was listening to to um, uh, to, to Malmsteam. Um, another guitar player called Dan Huff, American guitar player. Who The thing about the thing I liked about Malmsteam that I was drawn to was this guy's not just a guitar player. He's in, not invented, but he has he he has presented a whole style of music here's the whole package yeah. he's not playing like anyone else yep. he's doing this classical thing now you might hate it or you might like it whatever you got to give him points that sounded pretty amazing like that was a whole different world he, welcome to my world who else i, I almost said one note and you can tell it's him uh but exactly. in that space of one note he'll put a, a, a hundred notes yeah. <laughs> hundred notes and you know it's him <laughs> yeah um and if you see i mean i i watched it again the other night i mean um i mean i don't know I, did I own any records? I think I did buy one record, one Melmsteam record. Um, uh, I, I obviously never tried to copy him because he was doing the, the you know the harmonic minor thing. It was like that's just not going to fit into anything I do. That's his world. Leave it alone. You know he does that. Um, but the thing I loved about it was it was a similar thing to Holdsworth. And people think, how can you mention two of those names at the same you know in the same breath? Well, the thing was. What I loved about it was Holdsworth had done the same thing in in, in, in uh, re, 
he'd invented his own music. He had invented a style. And they're the guitarists to me that really, really stand out, you know. Um, it's so different. Um, he hasn't copied anyone. It's like, it's his thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And to a degree, you know, more of a rock and roll way. Okay, Ingve was doing that too. And if I really go back, I can honestly say that Hendrix did that. Hendrix came out with a whole new sound. No one sounded like that. No one. There was no, no, no one was even close. Yeah. He did it. And not only that, he could write pop songs. I mean, Foxy Lady is a pop song. I mean, yeah. you know, Third Stone from the Sun, um, uh, all those things. And then there was the, the blues thing with Red House. And that was a, that, that's the Hendrix world. So you got the Holdsworth world, the Hendrix world. And I reckon I would argue to a degree, and I'm not a Clapton, not that much of a Clapton fan anymore. Uh, I was only ever, in fact, I heard, um, not that, that I'm saying I'm the same as him, but I heard Eddie Van Halen say exactly the same thing. As soon as he changed to a Strat, I was gone, not interested. And really, and I'm, so like Van Halen, so I was like, yeah, me too, man. Yeah. Uh, but as soon as he got that sort of Strat sound, I was like, eh, now you sound like everybody else. <laughs> Whereas in um, in Cream, it was and. I reckon uh, I, I can I, I can mount an argument that they all you know Clapton in those days uh, had their complete own sound happening. There was nothing that sounded like that. There were people trying to emulate it, and it, but it wasn't just Clapton. It was it was Jack Bruce. Oh my God, one of the greatest vocal, rock vocalists ever. Well, you can't even call him rock. It's it's sort of something else. Uh, rock jazz. Um, Ginger Baker. That unit. That was. Wow, I mean that was a whole that was a whole other thing. So they're, they're the sort of players that I was really drawn to. People who that not only um, you know could could play guitar, but something they had something new and different to offer that you really couldn't hear. I mean, all right, you know, I can't say you couldn't hear the influences. Well, obviously the you know Clapton is a whole blues thing sort of going on, but they did something else with it. They took it somewhere else. I mean. It, it, anyway, maybe sometimes I think all this stuff is bullshit. Maybe it's just actually what you grew up with that you think is the best. I don't know. You know, if they, I've heard it said that you know between the ages of fourteen and seventeen, that's the stuff that you are, are always going to say that's the greatest stuff that's ever been made. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you're so probably maybe, not wrong, eh? Hey? Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, they're the sort of guitarists I was, I was drawn to. And of course, there was always that technical challenge. And there's, a, I think there's a thing in blokes and guitar, guitar playing blokes that just is part of them is drawn to that challenge of the fast thing. You know, they just want to hear it. But I reckon they're the only people who want to hear it. I don't, I've come to realise that, mate. I've come to realise yeah. that. You know, there's that yeah. competition of, oh, I can play faster than you. But then, you know, some of these guys that do that, when I get talking to people that work with those guys, they will straight out tell me, oh, mate, that guy's crap. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, man, he just never plays the right thing for the for the song. He just wants to go blah, 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 blah. And, and yeah. you soon realize that people don't want, to, don't want to hear that. One of the greatest things I ever saw was a video on truefire.com, um, the great learning site, um, no affiliation. But... Um, Larry Carlton talking about the use of motifs in his soloing. Yeah. And yeah. I can remember watching that. And then the first time I played and thought, I'm going to try this motif thing. And a, a guy that I've been playing in bands with since I was 14 years old, Mikey, <clears throat> playing bass. And I started, I, I, I did it, you know, repeated like a bit of an idea. And he's just stopped playing and just over the music, I just heard him just go, oh, fuck, listen to that. I'm just like, oh, okay. And I did it a couple of weeks ago. There's a, a drummer. Uh, I was doing a thing with him playing and I did the whole mo motif thing. And he was just like, oh, yeah, whatever that is. And I was like, okay, okay, that's what connects to people, you know, just give them something to yeah. grab onto. Um, well, yeah. Like just a million miles an hour all the time. Well, that's it. And I think that, you know, it, it may interest some other guitar players, but um, I mean, I, I don't mean to put it down. I mean, hell, you know, I'm, uh, 10 minutes before I spoke to you, I'm sitting down shredding my ass off, you know. Yeah, me too. <laughs> you, you're going to keep it up, yeah. There's something nice about it. It just makes you feel good or something, or you want to break that technical barrier that you've had. You're working on something, but I can tell you for, for the style of stuff that the, 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 the album that I've just, uh, just finished is kind of like the music that I've always wanted to do, or it's been an idea in my head for a long time. And so as I was heading towards, you know, I, I was thinking, I'm going to get, a, I'm going to start writing for this album. Uh, and I'm one of those guys that kind of writes, I write a lot. I write, I write all the time. I thought, 
when I get into this, man, I'm going to go deep into this and I'm just going to do this particular. I don't know. I don't know what to call the style, but it's going to have some sort of jazz in it. And to prepare myself for this, I'm going to go back and start listening to all these great bebop players, uh, bebop guitar players, but mainly bebop saxophone players. So I, I went right back to Charlie Parker. I transcribed so much Charlie Parker stuff. I'm thinking, it's going to be great. I'm going to be a, I want to do a thing where, you know, the, the, the music, there's still hooks in it you know i don't want to do stuff that's so out there because i'm not into that stuff i want to i want to do something that represents exactly you know uh, my background and, and and the stuff the the values that i hold important that feeling thing it's got to have that if it doesn't have that um uh, i think you know people who know the, the ballads that i've done that i've been popular for will know that you know the, the, there is a feeling in it um and that's what i wanted um it's a, it's a different kind of feeling but it's still that feeling thing and I thought if I if I can get my bebop chops together because you know I as, as I told you I you know had Wes Montgomery George Benson back in the early days and I you know started messing around with that stuff and trying to figure out what they were doing um, and then uh, when I was in my early twenties maybe nineteen or 20, 20, I think I heard this guy called Pat Martino who's you know well known now but in those days like no one who everyone thought every time I said Pat Martino they say what that that El Martino guy who sings you know, all the old crooner ballads and stuff. No, I reckon I've got some Martino. records right here of that guy. <laughs> yeah. Pat Martel, I'd, I'd been driving home one night and I heard this track on, on the ABC. Thank you. Thank you, ABC. Um, and, and it was the old Buddy Hebb song, um, Sonny. But it was Pat Martino's band playing live. It's from a record called Pat Martino Live. Um, I think it's just called Live, actually. Um, and it just freaking blew my mind uh, because, you know, it, I'd heard all the other stuff but I hadn't heard someone play bop like that. The way he was, um, well, I didn't know the name of it, but now I know it was, it, it's swinging. The way he was swinging, the, 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 you know, the, the lilt of what he was doing. And just these notes, like he plays really fast 16th notes over very complex chord changes. And I thought, I didn't know what he was doing. I, the, the concept of actually changing scales in the middle of, I don't know what I, I knew that there were some things like I'd heard some Steely Dan or I hear the guitar players. Oh, that's not they're not exactly playing in that good old box position. They've sort of moved. Uh, it's like, but I didn't re realize that these guys had figured out. You know, of course, that's what bebop is. It's been around since the fifties. This is just ignorance coming up again because yeah. I've never yeah. had a lesson in my life. I've never had a, a teacher say to me, "No, no, no, that's you got to use this scale or whatever." Oh, I tell you what, I kind of wish I did. Um, but, but I started to work out Pat Martino stuff. Um, I got that record, man. I went down to this, this, this import shop we got in Melbourne and ordered it and uh, went and, and got it. And man, that's, that's, that's sun, sunny. I listened to it and I thought, I'm going to work this out. And so I started working it out. And it all made sense because the song was in A minor. Easy, fifth fret, box position. Yep. So even though he's playing chromatic, I was like, yeah, it's in the box. Yep. It all fits in the box. I understand. That's the note. There's nothing... And then all of a sudden you played a B flat because now I know that the, the next chord after the A minor was G minor seven. So we had to get the chain scale. Excuse me, I'll turn that off. Yeah, right, mate. Um, from he had to he had to change scale. And, and oh, sorry, that'll go away in a second. From oh, I don't know who that is. Um, oh, bring him bring him on for a chat. <laughs> no, it's probably someone. It's Hello. probably someone. someone is available. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I've got my robot working for me. Nice. Um, I, I hit this B flat note and suddenly he, he was in a different, he was, it's, what, it's not A minor anymore. Yeah. What the hell? I mean, yeah. you know, that's how dumb I was. Um, and I thought it was almost like a cold thing went through him. He's like, he's changing scales in the middle of a song and he's doing it fast and he hit that note and it's the perfect note to hit. I later on learned that of course that's, you know, the B flat he hit is, was the, the third of the G minor chord. Uh, I didn't know that then. I didn't know what a third was, you know? Um, but I kept working on it and I'm thinking, well, now he's in this position. Not oh, cool. Oh, something's changed again. And this doesn't make any sense now because what had happened was he'd got to a altered, seven, uh, altered dominant chord and no scale I knew, no, you know, pentatonic scale, nothing fitted that. And suddenly it was like, I don't know what I'm doing. What the hell? What, what does this guy know that I, you know? And so then I started listening to the saxophone players, people like Phil Woods and, um sonny stitt um sorry he's a he's a trumpet player um uh and a lot of cannonball adelaide i don't know why but I just is this still teenage them. years you're talking 
No, I'm probably 20 by now, you know. Yeah. So it's no, I really started late, man. And let me tell you, I really did start late. But you know, by hook or by crook, all these years later, I figured it out, you know. And with, uh, with lately, with a lot of help from YouTube, you know. So you like that, you, you worked all this stuff out without formal lessons. You just yeah, well, I've, yep. I never had a le- ne- never ever had a lesson. But now yep. I reckon it stopped me a lot. But I don't know, maybe it, it sort of really um, fired up my maybe it fired up my. Um, uh, passion to to to, to un, unravel the mystery of, of this whole thing and, and and you know and it's funny you know rick even if someone tells you you know look you've got just got to use this scale it's still there's still some magic to it it's not even if you just use that scale it still sounds like shit like it's like what notes did they use in that scale how do they put that together where it sounds so good you know it's like when people say oh you've got to learn the mode it's like and then you run the scales and all the rest of it. It's like, it just sounds like you're playing scales and then you run the yeah. mode of go, oh, the chords changed. I'm going to run this mode. It's like, yeah, well, yeah. that's what it sounds like. It's like yeah. the, the really good players weren't doing that. They were doing their, once again, they were doing their own thing. They had their own slant on it, you know, and then you, you know, then I find out about Pat Martino and he, he had an incredible life um, and how he learned and, and the way that he approached the instrument, which was totally different to anyone else. And he did it himself. You know, he, he figured out his method of getting around those changes, you know, and I reckon there's still a big element of that. This, the teachers, teachers cannot tell you everything. The, I reckon the best thing, well, perhaps uh, one of the best things a teacher can do is to uh, inspire that um, that feeling of that, that adventurousness, that discovery thing. Like, hey, do your own thing. You, it, it'll screw up, whatever. Um, but you know, you will you will learn what works and what doesn't work. Kind yeah. of thing. And, and that's kind of the way I did it. But the, the, the interesting thing about this album that I, that I worked on, I, you know, I had all this bebop, I'm practicing all my bebop stuff. I'm working at, I've been working on a lot of Clifford Brown. who's a great, incredible trumpet player lately. Um, and all this stuff's going to be so good when I go to record my album. I've got, you know, so many licks I can start from. I know how to get from this change to that change. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. No worries. And I started buying, um, I think, well, you know, it's going to be jazz. So I need a really good jazz box. You know, let's... Uh, Let's see what you know. I got to get this. I'm going to get this jazz sound like you know, Pat Pat Martino got whatever. And so I started going through this, you know, buying guitars online because there's none here. You know, there's there's no music because we're a small country. Um, there's very few shops that have a bunch of jazz guitars you can go and try. You know, um, so I ended up with a you know a fifties one seven five beautiful instrument, full of problems of course, as I discovered as all those old instruments. So <laughs> didn't really get the sound. I started recording with them like, well, that sounds like shit. Doesn't, that doesn't work. It's like I had the song and suddenly this stupid bebop solo would come in. I was like, that's shit. That doesn't work. So I went through a couple of stages where I stopped for a couple of years writing this record. It was like, well, it doesn't work. That thing about putting the jazz guitar stuff in does not work with the song. You know, what's that's just not happening. Um, and I, you know, I started going, I started buying all these different incredible, I mean, there were some amazing guitars. I mean, I had these Collings guitars and they're, you know, these boutique made things and they all sounded like shit really at the end of the day. Well, only because me, because they were not serving the purpose that I wanted them to serve. And to be, to be really honest, I really didn't know what that purpose was. I was just floundering around trying to find this thing. I got at least, you know, I got these, there's something exciting about bebop. I want, to make this work, you know, how can I make that work in a song without making it sound cheesy or, you know, it's got to be a different sort of style. And um, long story short, one day my, my daughter used to live in Japan. Actually, she lives home now. She's been home for a couple of weeks after doing her, her quarantine. Um, she lived in Japan for eight years or something. And so we used to go and visit her. And um, and this is a great opportunity for me to look for, me to look for some more jazz boxes, you know, because there's oh, some great Did you go there. to... Ochinomizu, is that the Which name? Of the, Ochinomizu, is that the name of the suburb in Tokyo that has oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the highest concentration of guitar stores in the world? Oh, oh fuck, that place blew my mind. It took me two days to get through that place. Yeah, it's just like one shop after another. It's yeah. like it's hard to do. And you know, I was looking for, it, when I went, which actually wasn't long ago. Um, I was looking for custom shops because I already got a custom shop, a uh, jazz master. I was looking for another one. I wanted to, you know, go for punishment. Um, uh, although they were outrageously expensive, and yeah, they they, they had a bunch of them, but I, it was just out, out of my league. They, by that stage, they were all up around the seven grand mark, and, and the the exchange rate was bad. And guitars in Japan are expensive; they really are. They're much more expensive than uh, in America, that's for sure. Um, 
so you know, I, I, I walked into this shop. I think it's called Ishibashi. There's, a, there's like a chain. There's a chain of yep, Ishibashi. Ishibashi music. Yep. Yeah, and there's one in Nagoya where my daughter lived, and um, you know, it's a bloody big store. I mean, what incredible amounts of vintage guitars and. And they had this whole wall of custom shops. Now I wasn't. There was no way in the world I was gonna. I'm not interested in strats. I've been been there, done that. Not interested in Les Pauls. Been there, done that. Um, I was interested in jazz boxes. Well, I didn't really have that many kind of. I was hoping to maybe get a. Um, I don't know anything that you know had that really great jazz sound to it, sort of thing. And. Um, they didn't really have any, so I thought, well, I've got my, my wife is off doing some shopping, you know, getting some uh, clothes shopping with, with my daughter. And I thought, well, I sort of sit down and have a bit of a play and just, you know, um, I would cut Fender, cut, they had a wall of Fender custom shorts. I thought, well, what are, the, what are these things about? You know, well, they've made them look old. Oh, that's a bit of a wank, isn't it? You know, geez, I don't know. And I saw this jazz master that had this gold plate on it. I'm like, mm, it's pretty ugly. I thought, but, you know, hey, it's got jazz on it. Looks interesting. Oh, I'll sit down with this one for a minute mate <laughs> it was like the heavens opened up. really it's probably the first time where i picked up an instrument and was just like this is my guitar i just started playing this thing and it was i started playing some of the ideas i had for my songs and i thought no i'll do this i immediately changed what i was doing like this would be better if i on this guitar this and then i realized this this guitar just made it is showing you the way of what you're going to do because right. i had this real thing of i'm not using any sustain i'm not i'm not going to bend a note i'm using flat wound strings uh and you know i had these preconceived notions of you know if it's going to be bebop it's going to be good separation between the notes it's going to be really clean because that's the thing i love about benson man you can drive a truck between his notes but he's so fast but there's still this cleanliness this this incredible gap, you know, even if he's using a little bit of distortion sometimes. And I thought, I'm not doing this jazz rock thing. I'm not doing the Larry Carlton thing. I'm sorry. It was of its time. It was great. I'm not doing that. I am not drawn to that sound at all. I hate all this sustain. This is where a whole bunch of guitarists are going to be going. This guy's a wanker. But really, that's, <laughs> that's where I was at. I was like, I don't want to hear another distortion pedal. I've had enough, you know. There's the 10 billion guys using distortion pedals. I ain't doing it. I'm going to play clean. And I started playing this jazz mart and I realized maybe a little bit of drive would be good, Phil. You know, it started, started to make me see that there is a way to do that. This guitar at the time had, um, had round one strings on it. So, you know, and round one strings don't suit my style because I'm, I'm a, um, a, 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 what do you call a Benson picker? I suppose I hold my pick completely sideways. Like it's almost, it's almost 90 degrees. It's not quite, it's probably 80 degrees or something. So my, my, my pick rakes over the, the round wound strings and goes, <laughs> sounds horrible. Oh, really? So, yeah. Right. So that's why I use flat wound strings because they don't. And that's how Benson gets away with it. Cause he's a you know, 90 degree guy too. Well, not really quite 90, but almost. So if you're using round wound strings, yeah, you can get away with it, but it just sound, that, that does sound pretty rough kind of thing. So, but I knew that there's something about this guitar, the way that it sounded, this guitar was one of those ones you pick it up and it just resonates and you know, it's even, it's like every chord you play and everything I played was in tune up and down the neck everywhere. It was like, there's something about this freaking guitar. What's going on? You know, I got started to get really excited because I started to play some of the tunes that I was working on. And as I say, I started to rewrite them on the spot, you know, no, wow. I didn't want to try it. And I had the tremolo arm. I was like, oh, oh man, that chord sounds good with the trim, you know? And uh, I, it, it kind of, it really was a light bulb moment or something happened that it was, it's, it's, I've never had that before. That was the first time. And I really didn't know how good this was going to sound. This is, it wasn't even plugged in. I hate plugging in guitars in shops. I hate it. I get really embarrassed. I don't want to be one of those guys in the, I just can't do that for some reason. I don't mind if other people do it, but I'm not going to yep, do it. Yep. Um, um, I get embarrassed. Uh, but I knew there was something about this guitar. So I got back to my daughter's place and, and um, I made an international call to my mate who's a guitar repairer. I said, Paul, Paul Gale, his name, great guitar repairer. I said, um, oh, I've just played this guitar, man. I've got it. And of course, Paul no, knows my history because he's <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, sure. That's another guitar for Phil. You know, no, 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 this is the one, man. Because I knew that at that time, this, what's it called? The certs or whatever it was, this thing where if you bought a guitar from overseas, if they, and it had rosewood on it, if they caught you coming back through customs and it had, they could 
just to hold that guitar because this is when it really just started. No one really knew what was going on, but it was very dangerous for you to buy. And I was talking to people and they'd say, oh, man, just risk it, you know, buy it. And, and, risk it. and the other thing was this guitar was like almost six grand. It was like, I mean, I know Whoa. people are used to it now, but I'm not used to paying six grand for a bloody, you know, no, no. A, yeah. a, 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 um, you know, lump of wood, basically. If it was a boutique jazz guitar or something, I, I, I can see it, you know, whatever. So, it, it, but I thought, I, there's something going on. I can't stop thinking about that guitar. It was like a love affair, you know. Yep. Um, but I knew I couldn't buy that one because I mightn't get it back into the country. And I wasn't going to pay six grand or seven grand and, and have it have some customs guy saying, no, sorry, it's got yep. rosewood on Quarantined. it. Quarantined. We have to, um, uh, we, we're going to. So here, so I, I, I ordered one. And uh, and so it's exactly, the, because the great thing about custom shop is you can, um, you know, you can tell them this is the one I want. It's a 1958 uh, closet classic. And they weren't making it anymore. But um, they, um, Paul knows that you know knew the guys at Fender pretty well, and nice. they kind of knew of me, I guess. And they said, "Okay, we'll make it one." So right. nine months later, this this one arrived. Yep, and it was exactly the same. It was like, "Yep, this is exactly the same feeling I had." It's got flat, big flat wound strings on it. You'll you'll see. No, yep. I don't bend strings. You won't on on the recording. You will not. You can, but it's pretty hard because they're twelves and they're flat wound. So you know. yeah, yeah. Um, and but here's the thing. Okay, this is the, and this is the weirdest thing of all. In all those years of playing in the band and all that sort of stuff, I never ever got a guitar sound that I really liked. It was always really, yeah, it's close. No, never. It's close enough, but um, uh, I, I, you know, I really envy Jack because Jack, you know, he knew the sound he wanted and he knew how to get it. You know, and he his sound on stage was impeccable, just really fat and for the you know for that kind of style that yep. he was playing. Uh, and I never could get that goddamn, you know, I, I got the Soldano preamp, the whole goddamn thing. And everyone's going to be saying that. It's in your fingers, man. It's in your fingers. Actually, it, what, <laughs> yeah, some of it is, but some of it's not. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I've been through this whole thing of I really can't get a good guitar tone. I just always felt that way, which is, you know, people thinking you're, you're crazy, Phil. But yeah. I really felt that way. I, it's just one of those mountains that I've never climbed. I've never, yeah. I've been through so many guitars. And, Maybe you're just uh, really picky, just really picky. You know maybe what no, you hear in your head and you just can't get it i think rick it's like i didn't know what i wanted yeah i didn't know what i wanted you know the closest i've come to knowing what i wanted is when i hear a great um jazz guitar sound like an old um <clears throat> an old benson thing where he's playing through an old amp that's you know that uh, that's been rec recorded through an old tweet or whatever and and part of that and a lot of that's that benson sound is the way he picks an yeah, right. enormous amount because i know because i've because now I picked that way and I've discovered it's big. It's a big part of what changed my sound as well. Now um, you mentioned Jack's sound being really good. Now I mentioned to yeah. you before that um, I'm good friends with Louis Shelton. He's been on my channel a lot. He actually just lives around the corner from me. Right. Uh, yeah. And he, when I had um, Jack on as a guest and I mentioned that to Louis, that he was coming on, mm. he said, man, that, that Jack Jones, he's the type of guy that would have, 10 marshals in the room and go through them all just to find that right one. Um, were you ever that guy as well? Were you like comparing everything? And I was always disappointed. I, I, no, it, it sounds like a miserable story, but no, I never, ever, ever came close to getting that. I mean, you got also, you know, Jack was, he was hunting that sound. I mean, he, he, he would go to LA and he would go to Bradshaw and he, he'd have Bradshaw make him stuff and, and he, 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 he had certain guitar players that he loved and wanted to kind of sound like those guys. Um, he was on a path with that. At this stage, I was more of a, uh, at that stage of the band anyway, where the band had now taken over my life, I'd given up on the guitar playing thing in as much as, yeah, I, I really wasn't practicing any solo stuff. I was writing. This now was my thing. I, you know, we were on this path. We've got this recording. We had a successful record. The next one's got to be successful. I was just writing. I, I really, and I just, Jack can do all the solos. I don't, you know, let him do it. It sounds great. I don't, I, I sort of let go of it. I, I'm yeah. suddenly a different person. But, um, and in a way that was a relief because I could forget about trying to find this goddamn sound that I could never find. You yeah. Know? yeah. Um, but, uh, and here's the weirdest thing I was, I was going to tell you, and, and this is so freaking bizarre. Uh, when I got the, when I, I got this guitar, I thought I'm going to put flat wound strings on it. I didn't know if that would work. Um, uh, put, putting flat wound strings on there, uh, but see, these are a twenty-five and a half inch scale, whereas all the Gibsons are what 23, uh, 20, 24, 24 and three quarters. quarters. Yep. Yeah. 
Uh, and so flat wound strings on those on, on the jazz boxes sound great. On a Les Paul, it doesn't work for me. I know there's early Benson clips with him, with him playing a Les Paul, and he sounds good on that. But playing wise, it, I tried that. I tried that with a gold top, didn't work for me. Um, so once again, didn't know what I was looking for. So I put the flat wound strings on it um, and uh, plugged, plugged it in. To, I got a Princeton Reverb, little Fender Princeton Reverb, real amp. I plugged it into that and used a bit of distortion. And, and, and that was the first time uh, I got a sound that was like, hey, this is kind of working. And it's working because there is some drive on it. You know, you, I dropped that whole thing of no, no overdrive, you know. But it was still, a, I could still play bop on it. I could still play, the, you know, the fast, the faster bebop kind of lines. And then I started to, uh, it's, it's weird. The music kind of tells you what it wants to be. I was trying to force something onto something that I had, you know, and, and the music will tell you that, you know, that's not going to work. Um, but then I got the Kemper and I thought, I'll try, I'll try, I was going to just try it out. And I, and I got one of the, um, it's crazy. Why, why get a Kemper when you've already got a Princeton Reverb? Well, I got the Kemper, I tried a Princeton Reverb thing on it uh, and that was it. Then I recorded something and it was like, once again, this light bulb thing, like that is your sound. Cool. That, and, it, and it was the combination of this Are guitar. Are you using the toaster head or have you got the, the floor oh, unit? No, it's a, it's a rack mount. Yep. It's a rack mount. So it was a combination of that. Um, uh, if anybody listens to the, to the, if they go and listen to Custom Made on Spotify or whatever, uh, it was a combination of uh, the Kempar. Um, and a diff I can use different, I can get pretty much the same sound out of most overdrive pedals, but I must admit, I do love, on the album, I'm using a, a way huge, uh, what's it called? It's a way huge, excuse me while I disappear. You're right, mate. It is special, a way huge overrated special because that's got a huge, it's, it's actually designed by, um, uh, Who's the blues guy? Bonamessa, Joe Bonamessa. Yeah, yeah, right. Cool. Made by made by Dunlop pedals. They're pretty cheap. Yeah. But I listened. To, Joe Bonamessa is not, not one of my favorite guitar players. I really respect him as an artist. He's he, you know he's he's done incredibly well. Um, I, I I do like the way he plays. Um, and and I, and I like the way he sings. But I love his sound. Like yeah. for that style that he plays. And this guy is a connoisseur of sound. I mean, if you look at his collection of amps and all the rest of it. So when Joe speaks about sound, I listen. He knows. Particularly because, yeah, he knows. Yeah. And there's this one clip, if you, if you care to watch it, on YouTube where he's sitting backstage and he's just got a little ch Fender Champ in another, in the toilet, and he's got a, got a little mic on it. And he's just saying, like, he's, he's playing a gold top, one of his, and he's talking about how Clapton got his sound. And he's got that sound. He's He's got the brown sound. It's yeah. He's playing it. It's right there. And he's just messing. And he's saying, look, this is how you do it. You mess with the tone control here. And he does this. And it's like, this guy's really gone into it. He knows, you know, he he knows sounds better than anyone I've ever heard. Before. Well, his dad owned a vintage guitar store, if I remember. Right. right. So yeah. that, that probably helps. That explains it. Um, so when he said, and, and then they, they, then I saw another clip of him standing on stage and he's, you know, got all these amps. It's a sound check or something. And uh, he's saying, look, I've invented, this, I've, I've worked on this pedal and I use it on stage and it's designed for an amp that's already overdriven. If you've already got your overdriven sound, this one will just add something else. And we've really worked on the tone controls mode. And I thought, okay, I'm going to try that pedal because if, you know, I, I love the sound this guy gets. Not that I, I don't want that sustaining thing or any, any, anything like that, but tone wise, I want to hear what that does. And man, that pedal did it for me. That was like, and that's what's all over the album. And so cool. it's a combination of uh, this guitar because I've tried other jazz masters. No, it's this jazz one, master. Yeah. Yep. And I, I think it might be the neck. I think that's where a lot of the sounds coming from. I mean, it's a, it's a, you probably can't hear it over there, but it's a, it's a really, it sounds like a jazz guitar, man. It does. Yep. It's just freaking unbelievable. Um, Tomastic flat wound strings, the, the swings. Um, and, and it's a combination of me playing sideways as well. So it's, it's the way the string plucks when you. And you put it does that sound like a jazz guitar. Yeah, absolutely. It does. I mean, yeah. and it's like it's really fast guitar to play too. You know, because the strings are so heavy. See, people think, "Oh man, heavy strings, you won't be able to play that." No, it's easier because you don't have these floppy little things, and you don't. When yeah, right. You, when you, I can hit the string really hard with my pick. It yeah. doesn't move. Yeah, you do that on a normal guitar, and you've got to deal with this inertia that's sort of going on. 
So if you want to, but you also said you're not bending strings. No. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. you might. I might do a, a maybe a half, half a semitone. That's yep. about all you'll get out of me. Um, that's a, that's a, an attempt to. Well, it's not really. It's like I just love that. In my own mind, and this is probably you know illusions of grandeur. I think I'm on the path of finding my own thing, particularly nice. if. If, when you hear the other tracks from the record, you'll hear what I mean. I, I don't think anyone else sounds like it. The guitar has this, um, it sounds like a jazz box on the record. You can hear this, you know, you know that thing that Hendrix does and Stevie Ray, where on the bass strings of the Strat, it has this beautiful, you know, I call it a bounce. It bounces. They get this bouncy sound out of the string. It just sounds stringy and bouncy and the note is round, you know. This guitar has that. Nice, nice. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get another guitar, but here's a have, have a look at this train wreck, man. In fact, I can't even hold it up. I don't think. Yeah, geez, you've got the guts hanging out of it or something, have you? Yeah, have look at this. <laughs> this is typical Phil. This is a, this is what a do you got going slide. on there? <laughs> well, it's a water slide. Oh, the knobs are falling off. It's a water slide, and I've just got it, I've got it mocked up with a plate. It's a pretty guitar. It's really, really pretty. Wow. I'm putting some, I'm putting some Lolas in it. And, and metal pickguard, huh? The aluminium? Yeah. Yep. Now, I think my, my concept only, and I know some guys have tried this, but I think that's a big part. Of, I, th I think it's a part of the sound because I got this guitar with a, with a really cheesy plastic plate on it. This. Yeah. Listen to it. It's just crap. Yeah, know? right. Okay. I reckon but it's funny that you bring that up. I was talking to Charles Cilia, the luthier in Sydney. Um, right. I, I want to get him to build me a, a custom strap with a Floyd Rose. And I've got one here uh, that uh, my black strap, the burnt one, I set fire to it to make it look like uh, Dweezil's uh, Hendrix strap. And well, that's got a, it's got an aluminium pick guard on it. And that's, that's got a sound about it. It's, it's yeah, really cool. And I, I was, I was brought that up with Charles. It's like, man, Am I going to destroy the tone if I go for for one of those? He's like, well, it does totally affect the tone. He he said even just shielding the cavity, you know, with all the the copper and everything, he he finds that that yep. affects the tone as well. Yep. So. I, I reckon it does. And and for me, because a lot of my sound is in the initial attack of the note, and then the note blooms and dies. I'm yep. not looking for a big sustain anything. A lot of my sound comes from the attack. And so I reckon that's, I think that's where this, the plate, anyway, I'll know pretty soon because I'm going to have Paul sort of, sort of fit that guitar out with it and see if I can come somewhere closer to, to this particular sound. But cool. it does make me think, you know, as you know, I'll, I'll be the first guy to say, look, it's just a plank of wood and it's got a neck on it. I mean, don't give me all this crap about bloody tone woods. And, but I tell you what, uh, I'm wrong because this guitar sounds unbelievable, you know. Uh, and I would pay another seven grand if I had it to get another one, you know, because I'm so scared of losing this one because I've never had that that situation where this is your sound, this yeah. is your guitar. End of search. I've sold everything else. Um, the, all, all my uh, I just, I'm left. I've got a couple of just you know burners to um, to get me different sounds and stuff. If I ever have to do something else, which I hope I don't. Do you um, still have a Pacifica? Because I know you was playing a Pacifica no, back in the Southern Sun no, State. I. I, I um, See, I don't, I don't work for Yamaha, so I can probably say it, but I don't want to offend everybody that's got one. I wanted to smash that freaking guitar. Really? Uh, uh, it, it was a great guitar to play, but it had a thin mahogany body. It had no body tone whatsoever. And if you if you listen to that particular, uh, you know, that's that uh, the duel, the guitar duel we're doing in Make a Move um, on YouTube, on the MTV thing, uh, you hear Jack's tone, then, then listen to mine. It's mine's like a little mosquito going, and Jax is like, Wah! but he had a genuine Charvel that he, he was did, playing, and right? He had a big Marshall cabinet, but man, I had a 200 watt power amp. I had a Soldano preamp. I mean, I had a rig sitting there. There was also a, a, a I think was it using a quad box. I think I was using a quad box. It sounded like shit. Hey, and did you know? That that did you know? You said you just said quad box. Did you know that it's only Australians that say quad box? My international what? viewers are going to go, a what now? Yeah. It, I, I found that out recently talking to um, a, a German, uh, Thomas Blug, who makes this great little uh, blue guitar amp one floor uh, amplifier. And he brought it up. He said, when I was in Australia, everyone kept saying this word. What is it? What do you call a speaker box? I went, what, a quad box? And he goes, yeah, yeah, nobody says that, but you guys. 
<laughs> just a 412 is that what they call just a 412 yeah yeah absolutely now phil i, I want to jump back a little mate now i'm aware you've got a uh, a new solo album out and you, yep. you've, you've touched on that and i'm going to come back to that because we need to tell people all about that but we kind of jumped a bit mate we we were talking about you um playing in the state as you guys were called then um yep. how did you guys transition from being the state where you were the front man and lead guitarist to becoming mm-hmm. Southern Suns. How did that all Southern come Sun. about? Oh, it was really, it was quite a quick change. We uh, with uh, uh, we were contracted for the contract was I think it was two two or three albums or something. I forget what the standard deal was back then. So we'd released the first one, and uh, you know, as I say, it was basically the the demo or the demos, or we thought it was a record, but um, that we'd done on the eight track, and that was the first state album. So then we started to work on the second sort of state album, and we were sending the tracks to um to the record company to listen to and we were getting really bad feedback now this scared the pa- the pants off me because you know they would drop you soon as look at you uh, and it taken us so long to get that recording deal i was not going to go back to you know that was like <laughs> it was what a gun to my head um uh and uh, so we weren't getting good feedback and you know, we had a guy from new york come out and he, he was kind of one of the guys in the record company and we did a special showcase for him and i don't know if he was that kind of impressed because you know at the time you know they were looking at us as a pop band i mean i'm not pop look at me i'm not a you know jesus um when when you think of the bands that that were around at the time um we were nothing like that and they didn't want to know about their guitar playing they didn't understand all that any of that bullshit any of the shredding and stuff they didn't that had nothing to do with anything and so it was like i was getting this feeling again like we're going to get dropped and we're going to be back it's now out of ross's hands if, if the company because ross was the a r guy but he, he wasn't running the company yeah if the company says we're not going to spend any money on these guys that's pretty much it and i, I said to ross well what's the problem you know what what, what what's going on and they, and, they, and they and ross came back and said you know, they had a meeting or something and he said he said well actually phil the problem's you um, you know, your, your, your voice is a certain style and it's, it's not, it's, it's not going to suit what you're trying to do. You know, maybe you should find a singer and you'd, you'd think my reaction would be, um, you know, heartbroken and here we go again, you know, but it wasn't, my reaction was hella fucking Lulia. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> not want to be the singer. You know? Yeah. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, we had a band meeting and I said, look, you know, if we want to keep going as a band, we've got to find another singer, you know, that, that that's what they want. And Virgil said, Hey, I'm working with this guy, uh, in a, in a cover band called, uh, Hans Valen. Hans Valen. <laughs> yeah. And he said, this guy, Jack, man, he's, he's a great singer, man. I heard him singing at soundcheck. He's not the singer of the band, but I heard him singing at soundcheck and he's really good. And, and, and he said, we're playing at the corner hotel. Come down and have a look. So he went down to the corner hotel and, uh, man, this guy Jack gets on stage and he wasn't singing. I think he sang one song or something. And um, the whole audience looking at Jack, there was a lead singer. This lead singer was doing all that Van Halen stuff. No one was looking at him. Everyone was looking at Jack. Jack was just standing there with his head down and just cutting all the solos and sounding awesome. Then I think Jack sang one song and it was like, we just looked at each other and went, holy shit, <laughs> what the fuck? Who is this guy? You know, he was. And then we found out later that he'd actually auditioned for the band before, like when he was 15 or something. And I think he was a bit pissed that he didn't get in the we, He was 15. We couldn't even do a pub. It would have been against the law. You know? Yeah. Um, anyway, so, we, yeah, we, we asked him if he wanted to audition. And, uh, you know, he was a bit sort of wary because he, 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 he really wasn't sure, you know, because, you know, he was a guitar player and he didn't know if he wanted to be the lead singer of a, of a band or something. And so we went into... We'd already started recording the songs, and we so we'd recorded always and ever. Um, we hadn't done Heart and Danger; they hadn't been written yet. But we did, did have always that was the track always and ever, and that was in that very studio that I was talking about, it's Metropolis, on yep. the very desk that you're talking about on yep. the SSL. And Doug Brady was um, uh, uh, mix uh, was the engineer. Ross Fraser was producing, and so we had the whole track recorded. You know, I'd done the guitar solo on on uh, uh, always and ever. And we thought, let's get Jack to do this track. And we didn't even know if it was in his key or whatever. And he sang on it, and I was like, I just, 
holy shit, <laughs> you know, I'd really struggled with this song, trying to sing it, you know, even though I'd written it. And it's one of my C tuning songs. And uh, I remember when I was recording it, it was really frustrating. Ross would say to me, oh, can you try and sing it like the guy from Talking Heads or just do, try and do something different. And what do you, I think what he was trying to say to me was, do something really out there. Like, you know, cause I was trying to sing it like a pop song. I'm not a pop singer. I never was a pop singer, but I'd written this song. I knew the song's got something about it as far as a, a pop song is concerned. I really like this song, but I was trying to sing it like a real pop singer. And I, yeah. I can't sing like that, you know, yeah. big notes, all that sort of stuff. It sounds, when I do it, it sounds really horrible. I'm okay doing my stuff when it's just written for me. And you know, this is what I'm comfortable with. This is what I naturally would sing. I cannot sing a cover. I cannot, I will never sing a cover because I can't do that. Um, and I'm not embarrassed about that. I'm kind of a bit proud actually. Um, and Jack sang it and was like, this fucking hit. It's just, wow. you know, I don't think about his, but that sounds like one to me. And so I could see Ross was getting pretty excited too, but here's the thing. And I've said this on another interview, so I can say it again. Ross and I went for a walk down the corridor and he said, uh, and he, Ross said, so what do you reckon? And I said, man, he's in, it's, it's fucking great. And he said, and Ross said, I'm not sure. Really? Like, yeah. Ross, he said, uh, he said, I reckon he's three quarters away there. And I reckon it was, he sounds like John. He sounds John, like John. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. And that's probably what his worry was, but he didn't want to say it. Um, but to me, it was like, the kid looks great. Um, I probably wasn't thinking that because I didn't know anything about that. I didn't know we'd get that reaction when Jack was on stage that all the girls would be like, look at this guy. I, we don't, I didn't know that. I, I don't know how that works. You know, um, there's not, I didn't know enough about pop to know that. I just knew, you know, it sounded amazing. I'd, I'd heard someone else sing one of my songs and it was like, Oh, that's, that's okay. This is, you know, he's not having any trouble with the notes. He's, he, he, he knows how to, and the thing is with Jack, he can he can deny it till the day he dies but that guy knows how to interpret a song he re, and it's just in him to do it you know he knows how to interpret a song and he will make you feel that thing you know that's and that's the big difference isn't it that's a big yeah. difference i know i know people uh and, and i work a little bit as a as a producer locally and there, there's people who are singers and then there's other people who are trying to sing and the difference mm -hmm. is it's not a technical thing it's they're believing every fucking yep. word they're singing. Their heart is in it. Yeah, Jack's and... a very emotional guy, and 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 I think he he probably didn't even know it himself. That yeah, he probably knew he can sing. I mean, let's not let's not kid ourselves. But I don't think he knew he could connect so much with people with that voice. You know, it's that connection thing. It's like when John when Farnham sings. You know, it's people say, why is he so goddamn popular? Because it connects. You know, yeah. but here's the thing, Rick. I reckon. Some of us feel it. Some of us are not into that. Some of us are into other, because I've, I've learned that as, I, as I've gotten older. Some songs that, a lot of songs that I think are classic, most emotional, beautiful songs. I look at them and I think, no one's listening. Like I look at another song that's really commercial. It's like, that's got way more hits. How come people aren't going for, some people are just not wired like that. that and there's nothing wrong with that. They're just, it's just different, you know? Yeah. But Jack has that thing a vulnerability about him because he was a you know he was a young guy and I think he was he was not sure of of what was going on in his life at the time he was kind of in this change kind of period I guess um, I mean we had to we had to convince the guy to join the band I mean he really? wasn't he wasn't that interested you know yeah. really um, uh, you know we he, and I, I can kind of understand it you know because he was he was quite happy playing guitar in this band and they were probably you know you had we had enough bucks to get by kind of thing yep he didn't know us we were completely new guys you know um didn't know us that way he probably knew a virgil kind of thing um but i think um uh, maybe when he heard himself coming back on the track he maybe thought well something going on here sort of thing um so then uh you know he we we said you know you're walking into a you were walking into a recording deal it's done we've got the deal we're we're signed you know you're yep. walking in i don't know if that meant anything to him or if he knew much about that at the time i don't know what he was looking for to be honest i really really don't know but um or whether he was just playing hard to get or something uh, yeah I, I i i i don't go back and watch these interviews i find it very hard to watch myself but i seem to recall 
Erwin, Jack, uh, saying that he was absolutely stoked to join you guys and that, you know, he'd been wanting to play yeah. with in a band with, with Virgil forever. But I guess he already yeah. was in, in Hans Valen, wasn't he? Now, yeah. you said before that um, Ross Fraser's hesitation may have been that he sounded so much like John Farnham. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, of course, you wrote Burn For You yeah. by John Farnham. Did that come mm-hmm. afterwards? After- afterwards. It, it yeah. did, yeah? Okay. Um, that, that song, uh, well, that idea, I mean, I didn't have the whole song, but I had I had the whole guitar part sort of going on. Um, that was, as I said, when I, when I heard Jack sing my song, I thought, okay, this is what you are, you're a writer. That's when it really kind of dawned on me that, you know, you don't have to be the front, you're not a front guy, forget it, you know. And that was really easy to let go That's of. really hard to let go of, man, ego-wise. There's a lot of guys oh, out there, not just guys, girls, that, oh, you, you're no, great, but you're not a front person, you know, and it's a yeah, hard yeah. thing to let go of, isn't it? It, it, well, well, you said it wasn't I mean, for you. No, uh, that was just a, 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 you know, and Jack now knows what a what a responsibility that was. You know, that is a whole other thing, and I don't think he was ready. For, I mean, you know, I can, I can, I think I can say that as a nineteen year old, he wasn't ready for that sort of attention. He didn't know what hit him. You know, I mean, it, on one side it was just great. You know, great, they love us. You know, bloody hell, you know. But on the other side, you know, hey, you've got to be at the at the. Uh, we're doing a seven o'clock interview tomorrow morning. Uh, they want us to sing uh, Heart and Danger, uh, which has got an a, a top A in it. Um, uh, and they want us to sing blah, blah. And it's like, holy shit. And this is just going on and on and on. And when you're on tour, you know, the other guys would be, you know, sleeping in and me and Jack would be fronting up the radio. There's all those sorts of things. And then there was all the media kind of stuff. I mean, we turned into a pop pop band. Like, what the hell? You know, it, 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 suddenly we found ourselves in this situation. Um, but the funny thing was with the band, Rick, was that, you know, when we did gigs in Melbourne, there'd be all the musos midway through the audience or standing up the back, just you know, like, you know, come on. <laughs> Arms folded, yep. Yeah. It's Donati, it's Jones, <laughs> it's Buckle. Come on, you know, come on, you got to do this thing. And, you know, Jeff and, and, and Peter. Um, uh, so we had the the musos knew what was going on. And then we had all the girls up the front. And it was, it was this strange kind of thing of, what are we? <laughs> what the yeah, hell? Are yeah, we? yeah, yeah. Um, uh, As I said, man, like I used to rock up to you, you guys' gigs in the afternoon, knowing you, you'd be sound checking and, and letting loose a bit. And yeah, um, yeah but the, the people who are more into the pop music didn't know that, that you guys, it's yeah, like they, John Mayer. You know, I mentioned to people about John Mayer as a guitar player who strictly listen to the radio and pop. And they're going, Oh, does he play guitar? And it's just like, oh, Does yeah. he play guitar? <laughs> you know? Yeah, he really kept that not well hid, but he played that. I mean, you know, he played that well. He he knew what was important to yeah. to his to his larger audience, I guess. But now he's used it. You know, he slowly brought it out. And now all the musos know what a great player he is. Yeah, now. yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it was a it was a big change. It was a big change. You know, all of a, all of a sudden, I'm not the leader of the band anymore, and blah blah. I'm not the singer, but I I sort of embraced it, you know, and and I felt a, a freedom of oh, now I can I can write. Um, in, in this other style where I don't have to worry about the range because, you know, Jack can, Jack can sort of put it up there. Although I bet you Jack's wishing that I had written some of those songs. In- <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so that's when I wrote Heart and Danger because then Ross, when, when he, you know, we'd been working on the, the state out al- on the, um, what was going to be the Southern Sons uh, album. Um, Ross obviously had heard the songs I've been writing for that record and he said, well, uh, he rang me one night and said, hey, John's working on another, Farner's working on another record. Do you want to, do you want to come and write? You know, uh, I said, no, I'm busy, man. I've got other things to do. <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, <laughs> so obviously, so suddenly it's like here I've come from, you know, being in that situation where I was, you know, OCD, had stomach problems, like you know suicide not i wouldn't say suicide what's a strong word to use but you know just not knowing what's going to happen and and yeah. not having a a great deal of self-worth you know you don't even take so many knocks before you, you know, yeah before yeah. it has a, its effect on you and so suddenly here i'm being asked to write uh with john farnham it's like holy and john to me was like to all us musos even if you weren't into pop or whatever you knew that John was the most outrageously talented and, you know, he was a God, he was like a God, you know? Yeah. And it wasn't because he was a pop, you know, he, at that stage, he, well, he'd done Whispering Jack, so he was huge. But even before that, I remember when he was with the Little River Band, we, we were, everyone was like, this guy's unbelievable. You know, yeah. all the musos knew that no one can sing like that. It's freaking ridiculous, you know? 
um so for me to be then the next day because when he got i got the call it was like yeah come tomorrow it's like oh well i just don't happen to have any songs but yeah sure i'll be there tomorrow um to stand in the room next to him and there's john farnham was like that was a freak out i gotta tell you um uh, it turned out he was the nicest guy on the planet sort of thing and the, and the easiest guy to work with but uh, yeah so suddenly it had gone from all that to Bruh! suddenly i'm standing there with john you know writing writing songs um and it was that first day that we did burn for you too so man wow. big cha- big change yeah um so, so did you write that the lyrics for that as well or was did he write we wrote the, the we wrote the lyrics together together um, yep i I came with, I had the, um, the, you know, the, the guitar thing. I didn't know what to do with it. I'd sung it. Um, uh, I'd sung, you know, just a version of what I thought the chorus would be. Yeah. And I thought I can't sing it. Uh, this is, you know, maybe one day I'll play this to Jack kind of thing. I knew it was a really nice guitar thing, you know, and I wasn't sure about the burn for you thing. Cause I was thinking, I was doing the burn for you thing. And I thought, ah, I'm not sure about this. You must remember, this is the start of my different writing career. You know, I'd always just written stuff for myself before then. I didn't know um, about, I wasn't that much of a student of pop music to understand a lot of the writing techniques that I learned later on and that I've now been able to shed once again. Um, you know, things like, don't make the lyric too soft you know you know what if, if you want this particular sort of audience don't be saying things like that don't say love don't do that don't say heart no 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 um uh you know because i've you know since then written with a lot of other people and written in america and written in england and blah 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 and you learn that oh, there's an audience what's your what's your audience we've got to write for those guys that's who you're writing whereas to me it was like no write from your heart you've got you write from your heart you don't write for those guys fuck those guys write yeah. what you want to write you know yeah and, and and that slowly changed in me because it was like okay now i'm in this business so uh, i'm a respected writer i have to i'm gonna go and write all these um to, to be honest you know i never had um great success at trying to write pop songs for people it never really worked for me it's it was always that quirky thing that worked for me you know burn views if you look at the chord changes and, and, what, and what i'm doing in the guitar it's kind of out there somewhere um um uh, it's a beautiful they- piece to play, man. Like seriously, when that came out, I was a, a teenager myself, and you know, I was quite chuffed that I would worked out my approximation of what you're doing. Uh-huh. If I was to go back now with my ear now, I'd, I'd probably go, "Oh, that's not quite right." Right. But, yeah. You know, it's a it's a standalone piece. Were you playing that on guitar beforehand, yes. or did you? You did. You you were playing that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and want, there is a question uh, question there which relates to this from uh, Big Fella Link. He's asking, um, was there a conflict with keeping it? for southern sons or giving it to john no but it was funny because um i played it to to my to peter my manager and he, he wasn't into it he just said no nah, because we probably more because not it wasn't that it wasn't a good idea it was that we'd had we've got other stuff the album was pretty much you know we don't we don't need a song like that no there wasn't that that conflict kind of never came up um we already had hold me in your arms uh, on the on that album um i think i'd already written you were there too which came out the, came out on the next album so we we weren't short of a ballad sort of thing um no the timing quite wasn't quite right for the band to do that song and it wasn't burn for you by then you know it was still just an idea and yes i was singing the burn for you. i was singing that but when john sang it i mean he changed it um i played in the idea on guitar and i said look i think this is the chorus i burn for you uh, and uh, and i had took my trouble no i had got myself into some trouble tonight something about call out the boys in blue or some shit and you know i, I wasn't that much of a really i was discovering myself as a lyricist and, and that was the only line i had and i don't think i had a middle eight at all um, so it was just a sketch but he loved the way it's when i played it to him he loved the, the guitar thing and he, and he he sang the burn for you and when he sang it it was like holy shit yeah <laughs> wow. and i just like I just got shivers i really did when he yeah. sang it yeah um and so we worked on the lyric for the for the afternoon we we, we sort of did that one in because i remember i played it to him at lunchtime and we and we wrote the lyric in the afternoon and we recorded it just before we stopped working that day we we, we had it at um a little uh, akai a track or something john went in and sang it and uh when he sang it it was just like man you know, I can't complain about anything ever again because I have had a, a few moments in my life where the sun just shone and all all the bad shit went away and it was just like, you know, some, you know, when it's, 
when musos get together, when it's a right combination or just a magic day or whatever it is, you do create something that is larger than, you know, yourself or something, you know. Yeah. Um, I remember when John sang it for the first time, he came, he came out of, he just went in a little room and then he came out. It was just a rough demo, me playing guitar and him singing it. I wish I still had that demo. Maybe I have. I don't know. Um, he had a tear in his eye. John's a very emotional guy. He's really, he's got a lot of, he's a feeling kind of a guy. Um, and he, he shook my hand and said, that's one of the nicest songs I've ever had the pleasure of singing. Wow. And, um, but it, you know, that was a three-way compo. That was, that was me, Ross and John in the one room working on that track. And I learned a lot from those guys from doing that song. Um, how I, I would not have, I, I gotta say, to be perfectly honest, and my ego will allow me to say this. I would not, that song would not have been born without those two guys. I didn't know what to do with it. I really wow. didn't. They had the vision. Um, you know, I had the chords, I had some of the melody, but then they filled in all the, all, all the missing part and they gave it a, they gave it a direction. And I learned that stuff working with them, the way John would move around lyrics and the way he would, you know, change a line here. And it was like, Oh, can you do that? I, and I, I didn't say that I was acting like, I really know what's going on, you know? Uh, but you know, we wrote six tracks together on that album. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, as I say, I, I, it, it was a magic time. We were driving. I remember that night after we'd done Burn For You. We'd done two songs that day. I think we did a song called New Day Coming, which I played a little jazz solo on actually on the Chain Reaction album. Yeah. And, um, and Ross, we were just, me and Ross, he was driving me home. And because uh, uh, John was out in the country, it was probably about a half, I don't know, that's only a half hour drive home. And, uh, and it was an amazing day. And, and Ross put the cassette in and played burn for you and every time the chorus came we just look at each other and be like holy shit what is this you know and it was like that all the time when we went into the studio and we recorded it john was sitting next to me listening to the playback and david hirschfeld a keyboard player um genius keyboard player had come in and done the string part never heard the song before just came in and programmed that thing that sounds real but it isn't it's david playing all these wow. you know all these samplers and stuff yep. he'd done that string so when that chorus came in and the strings came in, John just we did the same thing that I did with Ross. I just looked at John and he looked at me and just went. It was like, yeah, it was. You just, you just know that you've you've yeah. struck something special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And, and and that's the thing, you know. You gotta. It's it's that's sometimes I think that's a. Um, you gotta be. I don't know how to say without insulting everybody, but you gotta know. You got to, you know, if you're going to be, a, if you're going to be a writer and you, and you are, you know, you have to know when it's right. And it's a gut thing. You know, it's like, it's a shiver thing. It's like, that's so, you know, that's, that's a, a little bit of something that is, uh, I don't know what it is, you know, and you know, lots of people have done it, but man, to be involved in something that, uh, where that's kind of happened, uh, it's it sort of, I think it, I learn a lot from those guys and hearing, watching the process of recording it um uh you know the changing lyrics last minute changes all this sort of stuff i'd learn a lot from that um because it really wasn't that long before that that i was in the music shop you know just working every day in a music shop kind of thing and suddenly here i am working with these guys who knew who'd done so much recording before you know traveled around the world i mean i hadn't been um anywhere in the world um uh, so it was a great lesson for me and uh, it sort of opened a huge door and, and I think I embraced it and sort of walked through because it wasn't um, that long after that that we, you know, that, that I had to write for the, for, the, for the Second Sons album. So so prior to that, had you joined the John Farnham Bands prior no, to the second album? Um, uh, what happened with that was it was a, like a management kind of call like, what are we going to do to promote this album, you know, to the Southern Suns album? And uh, because, you know, Ross was our producer and he's John's producer. He, he just said, why don't you guys come out with John? Like you support him. You, you, you're the support band. Uh, and then you and Jack come out and play in his band. Because Brett, Brett was, uh, Brett Gossett was uh, in America at the time. He wasn't available. Playing with Nelson. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah um and uh, so that's what happened so we, which was great for us so we'd come out do the support and then we'd go backstage change into some different clothes <laughs> and come out and play with john and we did a heap i mean we did that whole tour i think john did all of australia or something that was a we big tour a of, 
big tour. Uh, mm. And it, I, I think it was like 70 or 80 shows. I don't know if it was that many. Well, I think it might have been because we did Europe as well. You know, we did all the summer festivals in Europe, which was pretty amazing. Um, yeah, a lot of experience. Suddenly it all went brrrr. Um, and uh, I remember one night at the tennis center in Melbourne. Um, I mean, I think we did seven nights in a row at the tennis center. Seven nights in a row. I don't think anybody else has done that. Not Pink Floyd, not U2, not anyone. Um, and uh, one night I was just standing there and it was, you know, we're doing Burn For You. And, and I, just, I just looked out and saw the whole audience just kind of, if they weren't singing it, they were mouthing the song. And it, and it was just one of those moments where, like, I thought, it really isn't going to get any better than this. <laughs> you know, all the worry, all the stuff that you you know the, the, the struggle all that sort of stuff somehow here we are we're standing on stage with john and he's singing this song oh my god so and i remember that so whenever i you know get to a point where i'm frustrated about something or whatever you know i i remember the good things that have been delivered to me <laughs> along the way so yeah yeah um, so yeah that was that that, that that was a hell of a time um, and then how did you come come about working with louis for the for the second album but the second album, uh, it was the old, uh, you know, it's hard to go back to the mindset, but it really, it, I, I do remember that it was like, okay, you know, we Ross did the first album. That was great, but now it's time to move on. It was really successful. You know, let's, let's get a, a, a different producer, uh, which is probably a bit of a blow, blow to Ross. Um, but you know, you, you, I will admit to there, if you have, when you have success like that, it does, well, I'm not going to say mess with your head, but you have to be pretty mature for it not to affect you in some way. And in one way, the, the, I've told you about the adversity. Well, that al the al that album and, you know, John's album was like saying, well, fuck you to everyone, like everyone who said we couldn't do it and everyone who said they didn't like my songs, you know, fuck you all, there it is, you know. Yep. And, and I probably took a bit of that attitude into the second album, like don't tell me what to do. I know what I'm doing now. Oh, I've, got, I've got some success. I'm gonna, and um, uh, so that was that attitude of, oh, no, we're going to go with, um, we're going to go with a different producer, and uh, and I think my ma Peter, our manager knew Louis from something else. He was a friend of with Louis, and so and Louis was great, man. Louis, um, I mean, you know, Ross was Ross was great because Ross is a song guy. He knows songs. Uh, Louis is also a song guy, and Louis is a guitar player, which was kind of great because um, he helped with that with that kind of stuff. Um, uh, so that yeah, so that's that's how Louis sort of came on board. But we also had the attitude. I remember this is a funny one at the time. Michael Brower mixed our first record. Michael Brower is uh, LA, a New York mixer, yep. um, and uh, we went across to New York, which is my first time in New York, and mixed that first album. I remember having stand-up fights with. I mean, I'm not a fighting guy, but when it comes to songs, and I, if I think something's wrong, Michael Michael Brower is he, he's he's mixed Aretha Franklin, he's mixed Luther Vandross, he's mixed Paul McCartney, he's mixed Coldplay, he's and he's freaking mixed everybody. He's yep. just the you know he's the gun. He yep. really is. Uh, and I loved what he was doing with the tracks. And, and 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 the way he works is this: he says, "Look, come in in the morning, play me the track, tell me what you want." And then give me four hours, come back and have a listen to what I've got, and we'll we'll make changes, whatever. Anyway, so the track he was missing that day was always and ever. And I've actually got videos of this somewhere. I've got you know I had a, a, a an old you know one of those video cameras. Yeah, yeah. I remember taking photos around the room. We came back and wow, oh, it's sounding great. I really loved it. He you know the, the, the drum sound was was kind of smoking and. Um, uh, although he, you know, he'd replaced Virgil's kick with a sample as they all these, well, or, you know how they do it these days. It's commonplace now, yet. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and he had he had his his way of doing that. And uh, I, I was looking around, the, looking around the studio. I was like, to, uh, listening to Jack's vocal. And every time Jack sang, I could see so many things around the studio. All these lights going off when Jack was singing because he had him through so many things. You, know? you can't hear it. But it's it's there a lot of distortion and stuff like that. He was really into that techniques that we've learned now. He was doing back in the bloody you know nineteen ninety. Yeah. Um, uh, but it, got, it came to the chorus of the song, and um, he'd taken one of the backing vocals, which was Jack, and used it as the lead vocal. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa! Hold on a minute, you just changed my song. You know that's not the chorus. Which song was this? Always and ever? Did you say? Yeah. So the chorus. Yeah. yeah. Of the yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I've always thought 
it's like the harmony becomes the most prominent part during the chorus and, and that was a decision he made was it yep it was a decision him and i said michael you've got the wrong vocal in there you know turn up the turn up the real vocal and he just looked at me and he just stopped and he said no he said that is the main it's just not exciting enough with that other vocal that is the excitement i said michael <laughs> come on my That's fucking the, song <laughs> i'm hearing the song completely differently it's like but you know, Jesus, you know, and we had a real fight about it. But then I, th 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 then um, I, I agreed with him in the end. And thank God I did. <laughs> but he would do that. And he did things like in Heart and Danger, for example. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember the song, but it gets towards the end and there's a breakdown. We didn't play a breakdown. He made the breakdown. He just started cutting instruments out and then brought them all back in at certain times, you know. And he'd say, Phil, what about this? Boom. <laughs> I'd be like, that's amazing. <laughs> Is that just before so, the solo? Um, no, after the solo, uh, watching my best. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, down. yeah, yeah. That breakdown wasn't even. That didn't there, happen. Man. No, he did it. He did it with the. Oh desk. shit! Wow, cool. And then started, and then he started. He started putting Virgil's kick drum back in, like, yeah. uh, uh, at, in a different way, in a different spot, sort of thing. Yeah. So I was like, so, and th then I realized this guy's not just a mixer. This guy's a song guy. This guy yeah, understands. Right. He wanted that song to affect him in such a way. If, if he couldn't get excited about it, he want to know. He's yep. got to look for something to make this song work. If you hadn't got it right in the production, he was going to try and help you make this work. And uh, it was he was bloody amazing. But to get back to my other point, I even thought having the you know acquired the big head of Mister Mister successful songwriter. I know second, his. Yeah. <laughs> I said, we don't need Michael Brown. We need someone else. You know, I'm gonna we, let's find another mixer. You know, it's going to be better. You know, and uh, so Peter said, because, Peter's a friend of Michael's, and he's like, mm, all right, I suppose. You know, and uh, we're looking around for another mixer. I was lying in bed one morning and, and listening to, you know, they used to have the they used to have music on on a Saturday morning, whatever show. I don't know what show it was, but I'm lying in bed and I hear this song by this guy called Chris Whitley. And it was like a slide guitar thing and fuck, it sounded so good. And I'm like, whoever mixed that freaking record is the guy that's going to mix our next record. So I rang up Peter and I said, guy's name's Chris Whitley. Whoever mixed that record that I just heard, he's a Sony guy. I know he's a Sony guy. I want that, I want to see if you can get that guy to mix our record. So a couple of hours later, Peter rings back and says, yeah, got him. No problem. I said, who is it? I said, Michael Brower. <laughs> <laughs> So I said, okay. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so Michael mixed the next record. And he mixed the, the record after that as well. And he mixed my album, my new album. Michael mixed that as well. Cool. So but, speaking of the new album, mm. we should talk a bit about that, mate, or else we're going to be here for hours and hours, which isn't a bad thing <laughs> if, if you've got nowhere to be, mate. Uh, I, I normally go an hour before I throw to people's questions and stuff. We've got a lot of people watching, but not many people asking questions. So if you are watching yeah. – Feel free to drop them into the comments section, sure. not the comments section, the, the live chat, and uh, I'll, I'll go through those. But, mate, you do have a new album out. It's been a long yeah. time coming. Long time coming. Long time coming, yeah. F firstly, um, where can we get the record? At the moment, you can't get the album. I've only released the first single, so maybe it's a little bit premature. The album's finished. It's mixed. Um, but... Um, I'm learning how to work this, the new paradigm, which is the internet, you know, how to release on the internet. And, yep. and every, everyone that, that I think knows what they're talking about is telling me, you know, all the YouTube guys, all the rest, they're all saying, don't, don't just drop your album, release at least three singles, which I know is annoying to, I, I would find that annoying if I was a fan. Um, it just so happens, I think I've got more than three singles. Um, I'm happy to do that. Um, I, I'm so excited about the album though, because, um, you know, I've got Virgil on the album uh, playing drums. I've got Jimmy Johnson playing bass. He's always been one of my heroes, hero bass players. Um, you know, because I, I, I knew that I needed a bass. I'd done all the bass parts, but I, I thought I've got to get someone to, you know, put their own thing on this because I don't want it, I don't want it to be a myopic record. You know, so this guy sat in, in a room with his computer and he's done everything, man. And yeah. it sounds like he's done everything, you know. Yeah. No matter how good you are uh, as a player or whatever, it, it does have this, you know. There are some people who can do that, but most people can't really pull that off. It sounds like one bloke in a room with a computer, basically. Yeah. So um, I, I programmed the drums. I'd uh, done all the bass parts. 
and you know Virgil Virgil wanted to be involved which was fan oh, oh I, I was kind of surprised to be honest with you because Virgil's he's really doing his own thing you know he's, he, he has created his own universe of stuff absolutely uh, but he made room for me which was unbelievable and he recorded it in LA in his in his studio I uh, got a great sound and he's he really helped form the form the songs um his grooves the way you know, I told him I want I don't want just you know I want you to do it the way you would do it you know you know obviously I'm not as way out as he as his stuff you know because he's I don't know what time signatures he's playing in I don't know what he's doing um and he knows that he's a song he's a song guy too Virgil he understood he, he really dug the songs you know um, which was amazing and I just yeah, I was so happy that he did and to you know we'd, we'd, we'd been in contact but we had I'd been to a couple of his gigs when he came to Melbourne sort of thing and you know he was off doing his own thing it's way different than what I'm doing but he brought his thing to it you know um, and he just grooves like a mother on this record and his hi-hats fuck me if I didn't do anything else I'd get him to play hot you know if I didn't if I was happy with a part or something I'd get Virgil to play hi-hats because he is really? got a little what he does with hi hats, man, yep, yep. is the master at that. That subtlety things, the the little things, and the way he builds into choruses and stuff like that. Um, so I said to Virgil, "Look, um, uh, I think I need a bass player. You know, I really, I need to. Do you, do you know anyone?" And he said, "Well, I think I got, I got someone in mind." And, and, and I didn't even ask him who. I thought, oh, "Great, let me know. Who, you know, let me know." And he said, "Look, I'll send someone. I'll send a, a couple of mates to your uh, the tracks that we've been working on. You know." About a week later. I get an email from Jimmy Johnson and I couldn't even believe it was him. I just thought, I don't know, you know, didn't, didn't connect with me that it was Jimmy Johnson, the bass player, it was just some, some guy, Jimmy Johnson. Yeah. And attached to it was one of my songs. And he said, uh, I, I, can't, I can't remember exactly what I said, something to the effect of really love your stuff, man. I hope you don't mind. I've, uh, I, I, I've high passed your track and I've, I've put a bass track on it. I'm like, what? Jimmy Johnson's playing. Then, then it dawned on me. This is Jimmy Johnson. This is must be Virgil's friend you know and fuck me you know there's jimmy playing on my track it was like holy shit uh, i didn't dream that you know anyway i won't go on about it everybody knows if you you know if you're a holsworth fan or if you're a james taylor fan or whatever jimmy's just the man and, and the thing about jimmy is then his choice well his groove obviously but his choice of notes it's just i never think of that stuff that's what you you love when you use someone who knows their thing they're yeah. doing stuff you didn't think of yeah. and it's better than what you you know what i'm saying it's, it's yeah. like yeah it's taken the song to to a whole other place he would use some of my parts which was lovely but he would he then he would do his own thing and be like holy shit, you know nothing um i mean my stuff is not like technically let's go berserk time um there's probably not even one fast solo on it or anything like that. It's not you know i'm still a song guy i, I still use those um thing that those elements that have always appealed to me the melodies uh, you know i'm just a hook guy too i just love a good hook you know yeah um but i want to do it in a different way i wanted to make a style of music that was a little it's got the jazz element to it i really don't even know what to call it man i, I can't put it somebody somebody said the other day like virgil said first he said um this is sing singer songwriter jazz i'm like oh that's a really interesting thing cool uh, but I'm a bit worried about the jazz label in as much as it's not totally kind of jazz. Um, and, and then somebody else uh, on uh, my Facebook page said, oh, this is uh, prog rock with strong hooks. And I thought, well, that's, that's pretty good. Nice. But then again, I think prog rock and I think pretty heavy sort of guitar. It's, it, look, I don't know what it is, but it's songs with melodies and I, I think in, interesting lyrics. Uh, there's not a love song on it because, hey, you know, I'm older now and I just, you know, I'm happily married man. Um, so um I, you know the, the lyrics in, and probably the hardest thing on the album rick was the lyrics really i probably really? spent more time on the lyrics than anything else yeah i find it i wouldn't say i find it easy to come up with a with a with a musical idea but it's i'm more likely to come up with that and most of the time because i've done a lot of writing between um when the band broke up and now i spent 13 years straight writing for universal production music which is a, you know, they're a publishing company and they have a huge, I didn't even know what production music was, uh, but it's a way of, of writing a song and getting it played and getting paid for it. Whereas these days, you know, that's kind of hard to do. Uh -huh. So I ended up um, uh, befriending this guy who worked for BMG, in those days it was BMG uh, uh, production music. 
um, he was a big fan of Burnview and he's a big fan of Southern Suns and he he, he works uh, he was working at, in the office at uh, BMG he was you know he was nowhere far up the chain but he was working on this thing called production music and uh, I was I was broke I got it well you know just there was nothing happening you know it was years after the band had finished and I tried to get another band happening and that didn't really work at all and I was kind of at a loose end and probably not in a good place in my head and just didn't know what I was doing you know and um, uh, I, I had a you know I'd, I'd had a I got a recording studio I've, I've worked on my, re my recording chops over the years so I know how to you know make something that sounds pretty close to a to a finished product and um, uh, I was talking to my publisher and she said, go and have a chat to John down the back there. He's in production music. You may be, you know, cause I, they, you know, they, they started sending me people from Australia and Idol and stuff. And I don't know what the fucking right for those people. I haven't got a clue. I'm not, you know, it's like, I want to do something that's a little bit different, a little bit weird. And yeah, I had a few tracks with Shannon Noll and some of the other people. Uh, but you know, I, 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 look, it's for other people to say, but my opinion is I'm not really good at doing that. Um, I'm not comfortable, that comfortable doing that. Um, so I didn't want to do that anymore. And there wasn't any money in any way, you know, I don't make a cent out of that stuff. So, and you know, I got a family to feed, what the hell? And a guitar, a, a guitar habit to, you know, yep, to serve. Yep, absolutely. Um, and anyway, so I went and talked to this guy and he, he was a big, look, he, he had, uh, I think but he had sung Burn to you at his wedding and all this sort of stuff. And he actually sent me a tape of him singing, but he's a good singer actually. And, uh, he said, oh man, you know, um, you know, uh, once again, John knew uh, he, he, had, he had enough now to know, you know, don't don't tell this guy to do a particular thing. He said, Phil, just do whatever you want. But it's got to be a song. We need vocal songs. He said, just write whatever you want. Just, you know, just do it. You know, and I said, am I going to get paid? He said, yeah, yeah, we'll pay you to do it. I said, you're going to pay me to make a track for you. Yeah, no, no worries. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll pay. I said, okay then <laughs> you know uh, to me this was unbelievable because no one was paying for anything you know yeah. it's like suddenly they're going to actually pay me to write the track so that will keep me alive for a start yeah um, and then there you know there was just this dream of and then later down the track when the songs get played you you will get performance royalties you know um, he, said, he said but you know we own the song right you know you have to sign it over and most people won't a lot of people won't do that yep but i i'm like well you know i'll write the song and yeah, but I'm going to get performance royalties, right? Yeah, yeah, you always will. No one can take that away. You're going to get 50% and we're going to take 50%, but we own the song. So you're not going to get this thing called mechanical royalties. I said, what's mechanical? You reckon I'd know. What's mechanical royalties? I said, oh, that's if a company come to us, say BMW come to us and say, we're going to use this song in a BMW thing. We're going to charge them a fee for that. It might be two grand, might be 10 grand, might be 15, might be 20 grand. So yep. You're not going to get into that. Yep. So if you lived in another country, if you were in England, you would. If you lived in America, you would. Their writers do get, but the deal okay. you're, about, you're about to sign, you're not going to get any of that. But I was, as I say, I was desperate. I wasn't going to be haggling over that. It's like, you're going to pay me to write this. You're going to pay me, right? <laughs> and so I started this thing and, I, and, and, I, and um, you know, I did the what, what you would expect, which was not the right thing to do, would go through all my old tracks and go, what have I got? Hanging around. They're yep. going to love this, you know. And, you know, they seem to like it and they, you know, wanted me to do another album. And I thought to myself, this is a fool's game you're playing here, Buckle, because you, you're sort of not, you, you're not giving them your best work, you know. Well, I can't give them the best. I'm going to keep that for, what are you keeping it for, Phil? Who's going to do it? Well, actually, there isn't anyone. No one's, you know, if I did and it goes on Spotify, I'm not going to make any money anyway, unless yeah. I get, you know, 20 million hits or something. So... Maybe I will do my best work. No, I will do my best work. So then I, once I changed my attitude and, I, and you know, the thing about writing, or think thing about a lot of things, Rick, is I, I didn't, what I didn't know was, I mean, I didn't, they said to me, write as much as you can. And the more you write, the more money you're going to make if you, uh, if they get played, you know, if, uh, and, and, and they started this library, they called it vitamin A. And he said, this is going to be a vocal library and we're going to get other writers as well. But you know, you can, just do what you want. We need uh, 15 tracks an album. That's a lot of tracks to write 15 songs. Yep. So I thought, I'm not going to get paid until I write 15 songs. So I'm going to write 15 songs. And we <laughs> I didn't know I could do that. So I sat down with me because I thought, how am I going to do this really? And, and, and um, you know, what style is this going to be? So you know, I started doodling around on my guitar and I, I get a little idea and I think, and I'm lucky, Rick, because when I when I get an idea on the guitar, usually, maybe eight times out of ten, I get a lyric as well. 
Oh, really? Cool. And it'll be okay. Yeah, I'll get the title. Yep. And if you've got a title and you've got a little musical idea, you've got a song, basically. Nice. Um, uh, and, and so that's, that's what would happen. So I started writing these songs and I thought, they want 15. And that, that seemed like a mountain to me. Like, how am I going to 15 tracks? So I thought, I'll write two a day. Two a day. That'll take me, what, seven days? I've got 14 tracks. Eight days, I've got 16. Yeah. That's what I'll do. Yep. And I found that I can, and the reason I'm going on about this is because you don't know what you can do until you force yourself. And I had an opportunity to do this. And I thought, I'm, I'm going to, I'm not getting out of this bloody chair until I've got two strong ideas. Yep. And so I'd get up in the morning, I come, come up with one idea. Great. Fantastic. Make a little voice memo of it uh, with the vocal and the lyric, write down the title. So, right, leave that there. It's not finished, but yep. that is a strong idea. I yep. like it. Boom. Um, and then I just go come back after lunch, write another one. But then some afternoons I'd come up with two ideas. Some mornings I'd come up with two ideas. I thought, I'm going to write four a day. So that means I've only got to work for four days. I've got 16 tracks. I'll do that. So I did that. Got up in the morning. I okay, got one idea. Great. Now I'm doing it. I wouldn't move. You're going to come up with another idea. So what I'd do was I'd listen to, I'd just get on Spotify and i go, I need an up-tempo track. And I'd listen to something that was popular and go, that's the groove. That's a strumming pattern. Okay, turn that off. And then I'd start working on something that was that that kind of thing. So you start with, you know, some sort of vague idea. Anyway, long story short, I started doing four albums a year at 15 tracks each album. Wow. And I, I was writing them all yep. and I was producing them all. I was recording all the parts and blah, blah, blah. And as the years went by and my stuff st started to really get, and I noticed it was always the tracks that I thought, these are really good. That was the good ones that were getting played. So yep. I made the right decision by, you know, not just giving them, oh, yeah, this will do kind of thing. And then they came to me and said, well, you you know, we want you to do everything. You, you, we're not, it's much easier for us. We don't have to worry about any other writers. You're now the writer for vitamin A. That's it. So um, and boy, and that was like, oh, wow, I've got this whole project. You know, awesome. so I, I did it. I did it for 13 years. Uh, yep. and I wrote about 500 songs. I'm wow. not kidding you. But, wow. Yeah. And so... And, do you find it a lot easier to like when you detach it's like this isn't me it's not my band i, I don't have to go over everything and this has to be perfect do you find you that when you detach yourself from it and just look at it and just go this will do first thing that pops in my head bang that's yeah yep. you're, you're 100 you're you're 90 correct except for the this will do that's that, that that's a bit of a trap um i think i started out that way like they'll like this this yep. will do you know there is a point where you have to stop where you go yeah this this is now good enough you know otherwise you'll be there you know you have you have to know that this song is finished so whatever yeah. this song is it's now finished and it can't be any better well yeah. i don't think it can be any better than this but yes there is a huge thing where it's this is not for a band you know because a band has a direction we've yeah. got to do this or we're moving slightly in this to whatever it is you're stuck in that thing right it has to be a certain way it could be anything man and so I'd be writing folk songs. I'd be writing, and I like, you know, because I have a folk background. So that was easy as pies. Like, want to crank out a quick album? Okay, I'm giving you 15 folk songs. And those albums did really well. Um, and the beauty of um, library music um, is that it's never old, in as much as I still get paid for stuff that I did, you know, 13 years ago. Um, to, to whoever's listening on, on their site, it's just another track. Yep. It doesn't matter that it's 15 years old. Some of them might have dated not so well, but, uh, it, it, that, that, you know, it, it, I try to stay away from, you know, trying to be current so it doesn't sound, you know, dated when you, when you sort of play it. But, you know, the, the, it, it, um, it's really sustained me, you know. It really gave me, I was able to write and I'm getting paid for my work, for my art. For my art. I'm getting paid for, the, for my songs instead of just getting nothing and, you know, having them streamed. Uh, and there's some real good ballads in there, man. Um, I've got to say, I think I've written, written some of the nicest ballads I've ever written in that library. And they get used. They're the, the ones that have got the feeling, it, they're the ones that nice. they, they get. And some of the, you know, I had a, a stage of writing some pretty wacky, kind of cute and quirky kind of stuff. Some of that stuff was great for ads and stuff. You know, I'd, get, I'd see a YouTube uh, Volkswagen ad and one of my songs would be in it, you know. Yep. You think, uh, that's amazing, you know. People are people are digging the, tr the track. Does that, that ever had a happen of... where you, you might hear something and go, that sounds really familiar. Oh, fuck, that's me. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah, I, I actually that. worked for a jingle company for uh, quite a few years. And yeah. so I know that writing for, you know, being paid to write something, and I, I look back and I laugh. I tell people, mate, uh, this is around the time where I just discovered 
the internet and learning off forums the gear sluts forum for example yeah, um, yeah. as a as a wealth of information but yeah you know, i'm talking over 10 years ago not what it is now uh where you had some really high-end producers hanging out there sharing their their knowledge and i yep. would cruise the internet for three days of my working week and then in the last couple of days i'd just go okay uh they're expecting uh six songs tomorrow go and just first thing that popped in my head was the right thing and right. um yeah, it's amazing what you can do when you detach yourself from it. Really, exactly. It? Yeah. yeah, and and, and you, it's almost like a different part of your brain or something. Um, and that, and that's a hell of a lot of freedom to have. You know, just write write whatever you want. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of rope. You could you can you know there's enough rope there to hang yourself. That's for sure. But do you find you that can... that you um, and I've heard songwriters say this. I didn't write it. I just heard it in my head. I wasn't trying to write something. And I think some people say no. that if you try. Yeah. As opposed to just let that jukebox in your head play whatever that thing is that's going in, is that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a react, reactive kind of a guy. Um, it's all my songs always come from something I've played on the guitar. So I'll be just doodling away, you know. And if you doodle for long enough, you sort of get into this space where you're almost not outside yourself. You're probably inside yourself. You're not even thinking about it anymore. And all of a sudden, you'll just go, "What was that?" <laughs> and then you've you found a little chord progression or a little pattern or something and you've sung something over it because you know i'll be sort of singing away or whatever and you think that okay that's but that's the thing i was talking about before you've got to know when you got it you've got to know when it's time to put, you know catch the fly in the jar kind of thing that little bit of magic and once you've got that little bit of magic and if that's strong enough to be the chorus it's pretty, you know, easy to build up everything else around that. So when you lead to that part, it's going to be like, this is the standout part sort of thing. Um, and then I've got a whole bunch of girls that would come in and sing. I had, you know, I had a little roster of girls and it was great for them because, you know, they walk out of here with a good, good pay in their pocket kind of thing. I'd pay them X amount per track kind of thing. Sometimes they do six tracks. Um, and so it was good for them. And so we had, I had a whole little industry sort of going here. And uh, in the end, it was like, I got to the point where it's like, I just cannot have the time to be doing all the guitar parts and all the programming, the drums. That's the stuff that takes time, not yeah. writing them. The, yeah. It's a production. Yeah. And it reached the point where I could actually afford and they were giving me a bit more budget. So then I started to employ drummers and I'd send the track off to a drummer. Some, you know, I had a guy in Sydney, I forget his name, I had a guy in Perth. Yeah, you listen to their tracks and you go, yeah, that, that, that's a great sound. And so they'd put their drums down. Um, and then I found a great guitar player in Melbourne. Oh, God, I've got to remember his name. I forget his name. God, he's good. Um, he plays for Passenger, the English band. Oh, what's his name? Damn, that is bad of me to forget his name. It's been a long time. See, it's been years since I did it. I stopped yeah. about three years ago. Um, anyway, so he did, I didn't even play guitar, man. I mean, I played acoustic guitar. I laid the acoustic track. And then he had a studio. He would lay slide guitar. He would play... And the tracks would come back sound like a freaking record. I was like, great. I mean, I was making obviously less money because I was paying these guys, but it was much better to do it that way, you know. Um, and that, that's the way I would go about it. If I had to do it again, oh, I don't think I ever will do it again because I, I kind of, I wouldn't say it burned out. I just got sick of doing it. You know, it's like now there's something greater in my life I want to do. What is it? You know, um, ah, this album you've been talking about. Yeah. Um, it, now is the time. So I stopped two years ago. Uh, and started writing 2018 i started i think june 2018 i wrote the first track for the album and that was an interesting thing because it's, it's this this plays into what we were just talking about uh I, you know be, as i mentioned before that it was like write whatever i want i had complete free reign and i was detached from it you know this can be a this song this can be a that song whatever uh all of a sudden this suddenly this was the album that you always wanted to write phil this here it is you're now going to do it now it's pedal pedal to the metal you know you're going to go flat out you're going to do the absolute best job you can do you're going to go dig deep you're going to find this exact thing about the bit of jazz and a bit of bebop and a bit of this and a bit of that let's do it wow couldn't bloody write could i because i'd put so many things on it it wasn't like i was going to do anything it had to be this and it had to be that i had a couple of i wouldn't say i couldn't write i did write i didn't like what i wrote yeah i write stuff and go this i'll be really there was two guys there was a guy who was excited about it when i did it. it's like yeah great chords this is great and come up with this lyric you know i come back in a day's time or maybe a week's time i come back and listen and go it's a piece of shit. that's not what i want to do so there's two guys the guy that was excited about it, and then the two days later guy who sort of knew this is not it 
And those two guys hung around for too long. <laughs> it really did take me about six months and, and I threw away a lot of tracks that I really worked and I worked up big time, worked them up, like worked hard on the piano part, worked hard on the guitar part, uh, might have even done the solos and, and, and then went to lay the vocal and got and thought, what this no, what are you doing? What what happened? You know, it's somewhere in the production you lost the, the idea. Uh, and then I, 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 um, um, I don't know. I felt, I fell in. I thought, fuck, this is all bullshit. St Can you know what I was doing? I was doing this thing. I'm trying to think back to the time. You think I have learned, but uh, I was doing this thing where I would say, yeah, this is good. They'll like this. Ooh, I caught myself actually thinking that they'll like. They'll like it. it. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you yeah. mean they'll like? Who are you right? You, you, are you trying to? Are you really writing what you want to write and you, what, what's in your heart, you know, what you are? Or are you trying to please someone again because you spent your whole fucking life doing that, Phil? Uh, and, and when I discovered that, it was like, right, okay. Uh, I don't, you know, because I was doing things like, oh, they won't like that lyric. Um, that's a bit whacked. You know? I thought, what's, who's this imaginary person you're writing yeah. this for? For yeah. heaven's sake. Yeah. And I thought, right, I'm going to do uh, that. I, I, I started to adopt the attitude. I'm going to do whatever I like. And I don't care how complex it is. And I don't care, whatever. Uh, just stop. Do this, you know. And I did. And I wrote one song. <laughs> it's one of my favorite ones, actually. It's called Slippers. And uh, it's pretty It's pretty whacked. You know? <laughs> it's one of the most whacked songs. But I really <laughs> like it. And I thought, well, who am I pleasing? I'm pleasing myself, right? That's uh, If it pleases me, it's going on the record. Yeah. And what I did. Um, and so as soon as I see that other person coming into the room that they like this or this is really hooky, they're going to love it. It's like, fuck off. Yeah, <laughs> because yeah. Because a lifetime of that. I've had a lifetime of, you know, where's the hook? Come on. Where's yeah. the, where's the, where's the, where's this song leading to? Come on. He's got to deliver. So now my, the songs are sort of based on a musical idea. I, uh, I discovered that what I really wanted to hear, I mean, I'd listen to some of the old bebop stuff. Um, uh, Kenny Burrell, I'd listen to some old Kenny Burrell stuff and it'd be like, man, that's just a great riff. It's just a great riff. The whole song's hanging off that fucking riff. It's just a great riff. And I thought, that's what, maybe, maybe I can do that. Maybe that's a good formula for what I'm trying to do here because I'm trying to do a guitar thing, it's definitely guitar based. Maybe, if, and so I started messing around with, because I never used to do that. I mean, writing riffs is kind of hard, but I kind of did that. So if it, if the song hasn't got a riff in it, I'm not doing it because I got into this thing of just doing like great chord progression. Like these are really interesting chords, yeah. but that songs didn't work. It needed a backbone. It needed this solid thing. And the solid thing is a riff. And so if you listen to the first track, which is, which is called custom made, it starts with a riff, whole bass, the whole song is hanging off that riff. Some pretty whacked out chords in that one. Let me tell you. Um, and that's what I did. Most of the songs are like that. And every time, I'm telling you my secret writing formula here, by the way. I'm giving away all the secrets. I won't tell anybody, mate. I won't tell anybody. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Every time I strayed from that path, from you've got to have this solid thing to start with, and that's going to be a riff. Or if it's a chord thing, it's just a, uh, it, it's like a three chord pattern that keeps repeating, which is a riff, right? You've got to have that. And that was that's a great thing. Now, maybe not every song is that, but most of them are. Most of them are based on a, a guitar riff. It's either a chord riff or a, or a, or a you know a, a, a notey kind of riff. And I tell you, even to you know up until a week ago, I threw away another song because I strayed from the path, you know. And I had this great chord progression, man, really cool. I couldn't make it work. I could not. I mean, you know, I, I guess there's a certain standard I'm trying to hit, but it just wasn't right you know and i keep going back to it and go there's something there there's something there and i'll tell you what i did and this will be good for a lot of other people um so it's not just about me all the time um i went back and this particular track i'm working on i went back and listened to my original idea so i always have you know either a phone or a, mainly this ipad where i have a little thing that you know a sketch pad where i just i'm mumbling something i'm singing a melody and i've got a, got the riff or i've got whatever i've got and i talk about it and i'd say you know third finger on the first fret blah 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 blah. and so i remember it because i've got there's lots of ideas on there you know so i went back to this idea and i and i was like i got this little that little shiver thing, not a shiver, but a little thing in your gut that says, that's good. Yeah. I thought I lost it. I had it. There it is on the demo after, you know, three or four weeks of 
production and trying to produce a thing, you lost it. Somewhere along the line, you changed something, didn't you, Phil? And I went back and said, yeah, I changed that chord. I thought it'd be smarter to do something here, blah, blah. And in that process, I lost the song. So now I'm going to go back and do that song again, maybe. Uh, or then I just feel like writing something new and I've had enough of that working on that bloody. But, you know, maybe that's that's the life of a writer. You know, you try these things. Sometimes when you the song comes out of your head into the real world, it's not what you thought it was going to be. And probably because you screwed it up somewhere along the line. It's a wrong sound, wrong groove. Really hard to do it when you're programming, man. I tell you, I wish... You know, I, there was a stage where we were going to build a studio at the house. We just couldn't afford to do it. And I wanted a drum room. I wanted to be able to call a drummer and say, I've got this idea, come down yep. and just paint whatever. Just come down and play. I want that groove, whatever the groove is that you can think of to go over this. Then you got something. But I've usually just got a riff or something. Think, what groove can I put to this? And it's like, oh, man, you can lose the track so easily if you do not get that career. This is why I love it where, with, when, when you've got a band because you just – Hey guys, I got this idea. Yep. <laughs> Other people's input. That. You're not overthinking it yourself. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And that'll be the next thing I do. The next record I'm going to do, I'm, I'm somehow going to do that. I don't know how, but I think what I'm going to, I'm going to change. I'm not going to sit around programming drums all day. Let me tell you, hey, I had enough of that. Um, easy drummer. As good as the, easy drummer. Yeah. Have you tried oh, easy no, drummer? I've, I've got every drum program. Every oh. time. I've, got, I've got them all. I've got superior three. I've had it for years. I've, you know, I had all the superior ones. I've got easy drummer as well. I've got uh, addictive, addictive drums. I've got all the drum things you can get in native instruments. Yeah. In it's still not the same as actually somebody who just plays drums, hearing a track and going, it needs this rather than yep. trying to make something fit it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you've got their feel, you know, and there are drummers where I can, I, I can call on to do that. So I'm going to do that uh, definitely from now on. Um, that, that'll probably be one of the changes I because the tracks all the, all the tracks took another level as soon as Verge went on it it went up a notch bass went on it went up a notch backing singers got the backing singers to come in ugh, went up another notch you know so every time you add a human it just gets better and better and better yeah. Um, so, but look, I'm really pleased, uh, really, really, um, I just can't wait for people to hear it, to be honest. I'm so excited. Awesome. Got, so how far uh, off until you're releasing it all? Well, the first, the first uh, single is out, custom made. You can listen to that on Spotify. Um, it's on Apple music as well, I think. Um, and that's already got a couple of thousand listens, which is great. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of it's like anything's a bonus. Cause I figured it's only a certain amount of people are going to get into this stuff, you know, with yeah. this wacky chords and, or, and there's a guitar solo on every song, man. There is a guitar solo. On cool. Every song. Cool. Um, so if, if people go to my uh, YouTube site, you can have a listen to Custom Made there, or you, or you can go to Spotify and listen to it. You can go to Spotify and listen to it. You can get an extra, you know, oh, I've got 2001. Woohoo! Or sell it on Bandcamp. Have you heard about Bandcamp? That, yeah, that, but I, so I'm, with, I'm with CD Baby. So oh, I'm, okay, yep. Although I'm not signed with them, but they're, they're my aggregator. They're the okay, logo. yep, yep. Um, but yeah, it will be for sale. And when, when the album comes out, yes, I will have CDs and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we're doing a film clip for Custom Made on Thursday. Um, but I, you know, I, and I will be doing things on Instagram. So if people want to follow me on Instagram, I think it's just Phil Dot Buckle. I think. Oops, I don't even know what my Instagram address is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do like alternative uh, solos. Um, that's the first thing I'm going to do for because Custom Made's got a it's got a really lovely progression to play to, and it changes keys, not keys, or changes key centers quite a bit. Um, and so I'm going to do an alternative solo there. But one thing I was going to talk about was that, you know, all the, I was saying to you that the, the, the beat thought I could do, which was on the jazz boxes, just didn't work on any, anything that I was doing. Well, you know, I'd spent a lot of time and I've got a lot of vocabulary because all, be, all bebop players have a lot of vocabulary, vocabulary that you can use, you know. Uh, but what I discovered was when I had the track and I was happy with the track, oh, I'm going to do a solo on it. I got a great sound. That sounds great. Everything up when I tried to fit those ideas to it, did not work at all. Oh, really? All. No, because it's bebop language, and bebop language is largely based on two five one progressions. So you know, if we were in C, it'd be uh, D minor to G seventh to C, uh, uh, uh. and you know, all Charlie, all the Charlie, a lot of the Charlie Parker riffs are all their, their um, two fives. That whole American songbook where all the bebop stuff. You know, they take those songs and then play them in a in a bebop way. All those songs are based on two five, usually on two five one progressions, and so that language, and even the seventh language, the, because that was the interesting thing about uh, learning all the bebop stuff. The the dominant seventh language is the most interesting stuff because you use completely different scales on that. None of that stuff worked either. 
uh, you can just throw all that shit away. It just wow. sounds like, um, so I had to invent a style on it. And I think I did. Well, cool. maybe there's a big thing for me to say, but I think I did. I think yeah. I invented my own style over it. It is a bit jazzy. There is some chromatic stuff. But there's no kind of, uh, and I tell you what big part of it is I'm swinging on all the tracks. I'm, I, I play swing style. So you can hear there's a lilt, you know, a slight uh, triplet kind of vibe going on. Um, Cause you can do that over a, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a, a, you know, even if you've got a four, a four to the floor bass drum beat, you know, you can still go, you know, you can still, you can still skip over it kind of thing. Yeah. And it sounds pretty cool actually. So it's this mixture of swing and, um, st you know, the, the, the guitar style. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, some people say I sound a bit like Robin Ford or Larry Carlton, but I certainly don't have all that sustain. I have a little, there is a little, you can hear the yep. notes do head on. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know what the style is. I certainly play a lot more bop style things than the, either of those two guys. And I don't play, and I play a little bit of blues just a bit. And that worked blues, man, blues works in everything. It really universal. Does. It's universal. Man. Yeah. Yep. I remember listening to an interview with George Benson when he was playing with this guy called Jack McDuff, uh, when he was really cutting his teeth on, you know, learning. And he said, Jack McDuff took him to one side and said, man, you got to put blues in it. every track. I want to hear you put some blues into it. And he said that was a big lesson to him, and that's what he's done ever since. You know, uh, and he's right. I mean, it just worked in anything. You know, um, you know, there's no bending kind of blues stuff, but I will play. I do use the blues, the blue notes, and stuff like that. From cool. Time to time. Cool. Anyway, if people go to listen, they can they they can sort of maybe they'll say, Phil, you're up yourself. It's got. It just sounds like another fucking guitar player to me, mate. <laughs> well, I'm very much looking forward to having to listen to it myself, mate. Um... It, it sounds like a, a very interesting uh, album, man. And um, yeah, absolutely. Phil, I'm going to go start going through some of the questions there. I think you've actually yeah. answered uh, most of them uh, yeah. that have popped up. But while I scan through that, I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned that you were using a Soldano preamp back in Southern yeah. Suns. The purple one. The purple, the SP77, was it? The two-channel oh, one? Oh, two oh, or three-channel? Yeah, two-channel. Two-channel. I bought one of those yesterday. Yeah. I paid a fortune for that goddamn thing yeah. like, back in the day. I say yesterday. I took it to my repairer to see if he could convert it to 240 for me yesterday. I got it Sunday night. Um, right. But I was expecting, because we all know that the Soldano dirty sound. Yep. What I wasn't expecting was the clean channel to sound so bloody good. The guy that had it didn't know. He said, oh, it's got this bright switch, but it sounds a bit you know, funny when you turn that on. And he turned it on. And I just backed his treble knob off. And there was just that silky high end, and he sort of looked at me yep. and went, "It's a good thing I've got another one of these, or else I wouldn't sell this to you, man. You just made that sound <laughs> amazing." So I'm very much looking forward to yeah. uh, setting that up in a nice little rig. But oh, that nice was the man. one that you had, huh? Yeah, that was the one, and uh, you know, it, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't it. It was me. Um, it, it was actually it was that Pacifica. That was the one I was using in that clip, and that's when I was using that rig. And I remember actually throwing that guitar off stage one time in a fit of rage because uh, it just sounded uh, it's really it really made me um realize that there is a lot to do with the body sound of the actual guitar you know when you sit down at a music shop and play even a strat and you just go whoa it just loud. resonates and, or, yeah. or like oh there's nothing there what's going on with this you know? yes and I, I reckon there's a lot to it man and i was actually listening to um what's his name hind hind there's an American guitar player. I actually follow him on Instagram. He's Hind, Hind Baby or something on Instagram. He's a lovely player. Um, and he was talking about he, he believes it's the neck. Uh, the, the I neck. think so. I think it is. Yeah. Uh, I gravitate towards bigger necks and always maple fretboard for me. Um, yeah. That comes because I'm a weirdo and I pull down when I bend my strings. Like always okay. on a G string, I pull down. B, if it's a half tone bend, I pull down. But I realized when I was doing that, and this is, stems back to playing cheaper guitars when I was younger, that my fingernails would get caught in, if I bend ah. down, into the, a, a, a bad piece of rosewood, a cheap piece of rosewood. Right. And I just detest that feeling. And I always pushed up ever since then. But Isn't that how the instrument affects you, huh? Yeah, yeah. But no, bigger necks, maple for me, and people that play my guitars with the bigger necks go, how's the resonance in this thing? And I go, yeah, it's that big fat neck. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. I reckon it is too. And uh, every guitar I get from here on in, it will be, you know, my neck's at the limit. Like, I've got pretty big hands, but I thumb a lot of chords, you know. Yep, same. 
whatever. And you know, the next guest, the net gets to a point where it's like, this is getting hard to actually get my thumb over this goddamn thing, you know. But they're the ones I want. I want that one where it's just right on the limit, where I can still get my thumb around it, but it's yep. as thick as it be, kind of thing. And I love the the big. Well, yeah, I'm a rosewood guy. I love the big slab of rosewood. None yeah. of this thin, thin bit of rosewood thing. Yep. I want that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's a different sound. I, I think rosewood's yep. a maple. Yep. Man, I tell you what, I mean, it's funny. Guitars are weird, you know. I'm looking at my guitar now with loving eyes because it's just got the right kind of light on it, and I just love the way fretboards look. I walk past my guitar and I just stop and stare at it. It's really, it's sick, man. It's like I'm just hooked on the look of guitars. I yeah. just love looking at them, you yep. know. And it's just beautiful with the. You look, you want to pick it up and play it because the fretboard just looks so good, you know. It's yeah. saying, "Come on, play me, yeah. come on." Absolutely. The next idea is right there. You're this far away from the next song. Come on. <laughs> Phil, just some of the questions here, mate. Um, yep. Hey, Phil, how do you come up with lyrics? Do you write snippets of ideas down or question mark? Regards, Marty from Cutters, pre the state. Oh, yeah, Be that's Marty. Sensitive. Martin Hesker. Hey, Marty, how are you, mate? <laughs> Martin's a great drummer, too. Um, he was in the, uh, the, the Cutters from the start. In fact, it was... Um, I hate to remind you of this, Martin, but it was Virgil who replaced Martin. In, okay, in yep. Um Anyway, uh, it's a good question. Um, two ways. Um, the easy way. The easy way is that I'll come up with a riff and I'll come up with the lyric at the same time. Now, that happens about 80% of the time. Didn't happen, didn't happen all the time on this record. Now, when that doesn't happen, I've got a problem because I have to actually find something to write about. This can be a long this can be a pain in the ass and i've probably got tracks that i abandoned because i just never had the right lyric because i'll know when the lyric is right you know you can't you can't fake that it's just you know when it, you cannot fake it it's good has got to be something in the lyric the lyric and i've labored over the lyrics on this album because i knew that not only does the music have to be great this song has to be about something and it's got to be something interesting and you have to say it in a very interesting way the the, the, the lyric should stand on its own uh, and it, you, you don't always have to do that in pop songs. You can just have such a cool sound and freaking track. You can have a pretty lame sort of lyric and it's okay, whatever. But I didn't want to do that because I, I know that if you've got a good lyric, that is a really strong part of the song. And then if you've got really, you know, strong melody, great playing, great gro groove, then you've got something. Then you've, but it, take the lyric away and you've just taken one of the pieces out and it's going to be weak. So I've thrown away songs where the lyrics I just felt were were not just they're just not they're weak you know because lyrics affect you the same way as a great melody does you don't probably don't know it but it can hook you in it really can you know um, that's what one thing you can learn from pop songs you know even if you listen to I mean and there's so many examples you know you know, you know songs that are hugely successful you know say take a Fleetwood Mac song you know um, one of Stevie Nicks's songs you know. Um, without that lyric man it's freaking nothing and and even if you don't understand what the lyric is it's put these ideas in your head and it's just taking you along with the song it's got to be one it's got to be one with the track it's it's uh, super super important so so my next method of writing is to try and find something and i will sit down i'm one of those guys i've got to say that i can sit down for days and just concentrate on that i will sit here looking at a blank page and in your mind you're going on a on a trip because you you sort of and i'll keep playing the track and i'll keep playing the place where i know that the strong lyric has to be and i'll bloody find it and if i don't find it that song won't go on the record yeah right and, and, and usually i'll get something I'll, I'll get something and then you know you'll think you've got it and they say no it shouldn't be that but it should be this but you know it, it's led you on a path kind of thing and you found it uh, Custom made is a good example. Didn't have a lyric, and I always hate that. I'm like, this is a great riff. I need a lyric for this. It has to be something that's fun, and because it's a complicated, it's a balanced thing too. This is a complicated riff that I'm playing on custom made. Um, it's all over. It's some weird chords. You know, that's a lot of information there. Got to be a simple lyric. Well, that's even harder. Come up with a simple lyric that's good. And I was in the shower, and I just was going, it's got to be phrase such and such you can kind of hear it in your head it's you know if you keep going over it you, it's and i see uh, this is weird people will, will really think i'm a wanker now but i do tend to see things in patterns in my head and i'm one of those guys that also is a sin 
whatever that synthesis is. Synesthesia. synesthesia. Yeah, I'm yep. one of those guys. I see things in colours. And so yep. you see the colour, you see that I'm seeing a block of lyric and it's kind of brown and, you know, uh, I just sang custom made. And just, it's like you put in the input and uh, something comes in. And that might, instead, other people might think, well, that's just two words. That doesn't freaking mean anything. No, but it's perfect. It's perfect for this song. This song is a mission statement of the whole album. It's all the song is saying is, hey, I made something. You might like it. You might not like it, but I custom made it. And it's, it's, it's exactly the, you're not going to get this anywhere else. This is what I do. I just make this. And if you like it, great. If you don't, whatever. So I thought this, yeah, custom made. That's, it's, it's, it's simple, but if I take it in that direction, it can be really strong, you know, so. Um, and that was one of those songs where I, I did not come up with that first off, because that riff is actually from another song. That happens sometimes. Uh, that riff was from another song, which was, fa it failed. It was a good, I thought it was a pretty good song, but it failed because the groove was wrong, because I didn't have a drummer. And I tried every groove and I, it just sounded so rock. I didn't want it to see that. I'll admit that I didn't want it to sound rock. I wanted it to sound this otherworldly thing that we've, that we've managed to come up with. Well, I think, yep. um, and that track, that track was too rock. And so I took the riff and, and, and used a different groove. I was like, ah, now great. We've got this, this is great. And as I say, it took a few days and then one day in the shower, custom made came along. And then I thought, I thought of all my mates, you know, I've known a guitar repair, different guitar repairers. Um, and I've, you know, had a long-term relationship with one guitar repairer and, it, and I've bought custom made guitars and I didn't want it to be about that, but I think all these people are kind of the same. These guys that make their custom made things, they could go ahead and make something else that just look like everybody else. But I, mean, I know guys who have carved things and they've got this thing in them and any artist who makes something that is their thing, you know, that's what, and, and that's what songwriting is really, you know? You, so, uh, so that's, that, that was my thought process with that. Um, but you know, those things take you a long way away from actually playing guitar. I mean, I can, as I say, I can sit there for days and just, you know, don't turn the freaking computer on because you're going to be looking at YouTube every 10 seconds, you know, anything to take you away from it. Um, and you just sit there and concentrate. Um, I remember I did a, I wrote some lyric sets for an album that David Hirschfelder and a, a Melbourne singer called David Hobson, uh, uh, he's a opera singer. They made this weird kind of world music kind of album called in in inside this room yeah inside this room it's a great album amazing stuff david's an incredible programmer so they had like you know pygmy chants and then they'd have an operatic song over this and i wrote a bunch of i wrote five sets of lyrics i think that took me two weeks and i just sat in a room for hours but on what i discovered was the same thing i said about writing you know four songs a day uh, for for production music um i discovered i could do it if you, if you don't force yourself to do it, you won't know, you know, unless you put yourself to the test, you, you kind of don't know. And then you discover how oh, I can do that. Oh, good. <laughs> cool. Cool. But uh, I've, I've scanned through there and we have touched, answered most of the questions as we've gone along so far, but um, there's one here. I'd like to inquire about Phil's approach to his playing on burn for you. Uh, cool. I have an arrangement that is on the internet. He seemed to have used some unusual chord inversions in the composition. Mm. Okay, there's a lot of up and down. It's it's, it's really all over the neck. I'm not I'm not using I'm not staying in the open position, um, and I'm using um, I'm not using normal chord positions. I'm actually picking out. Um, so there might be one note on the bass string. I'm missing the A string. I'm missing the D string, and there might be a note on the G and the B string. You know, think it's it. it it's things like that. Um, it's, uh, it's it's a bit whacked, and I don't know quite why. I can't, I tried to play it the other day, and I can't remember it. Uh, I know it's those two. Uh, the, so there you go. I'm thumbing something there. It's like you could say it's an F sharp major thing, but it's got the it's got an open B in it, as well as the B flat. Yep. You've got to have that. <laughs> uh, and then uh, hang on. Oh yeah. So there you go, same chord and I've changed the bass note, but open string ringing away there. <laughs> and here's a weird one for you. So yeah, it's a B flat, right? But I'm in the key of E, what's going on? I was so result. close in my working it out as a kid, mate. I'm just watching what you're doing there. I've got, got my guitar out. And... Yeah. I mean, these were chords I was using all the time, you see. Um, 
And then I think ah, it's okay, you got there. I was doing the B at the second fret. And then the e, the e flat thing. So now here's a good example of what I was talking about. I'm on the so third finger, eleventh uh, fret on the E string. Miss the A string. First finger on the ninth fret of the D string. Little finger on the eleventh fret of the G string. Now don't play the the A string, but now you get this beautiful. And you can actually drop this first finger down, which I do in some. Parts. Oh, nice! That's how you get that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, up to the F sharp. Yeah. So you know, there's all these kind of weird three note. Um, you can see what I'm doing there. Uh, what have I got here? I've got uh, nine, uh, uh, nine. Don't play the A string. I've got six on the D string. I've got uh, nine on the G string. So that's a chord that comes before the F sharp, and that's just the you know standard F sharp chord. So cool. But you know that a lot of that stuff, and then when the chorus comes, I mean, but uh, so oh yeah. It's funny, you know, I used to play this with my thumb, so it's really the same shape, sort of you know, moved around the place. That sort of, uh, it's like a sus4 kind of shape, really. You got it? It's open E, open E, then uh, 11 on the G, uh, on the A string. Yeah. And uh, no, uh, nine. Yeah. And then 11 on the, with your little finger on the G yep. string, and the other fret is open. Now, so same chord, now take it down to the second fret and bar the second fret, but don't bar the E string. Yep, yep. That's what I had for own. those, yeah. And then up, up to, up two, to the two frets to that one, yeah. So what I used to do is thumb it. All right. Now one night, one day, uh, or one night, uh, at the launch of this album of the the uh, Chain Reaction album, we had to do at that same studio at the Metropolis Studio. There was a live to air broadcast upstairs of uh, you know John Farnham's new album, and we were playing with me and John playing Burn for You. And I had had my little Yamaha, and I was thumbing, you know, and I was as nervous as all hell, and so was John, you know. Um, it's a big deal, you know. We're going to play this song for the first time, and it's going out live. Don't make a mistake, boys, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm doing what I normally do. I'm thumbing this thing. I'm playing, um, and I got. I don't know, halfway through the song and this thumb, the whole thumb just went into a, you know, a cramp. A cramp, oh no. And it literally went behind the neck like this. So my hand was like that. So I was playing like that. Um, uh, uh, where am I? Uh, and, but then I somehow, I had to try and get my thing. And you can just hear it on the tape. You can just hear it. And, and you know, literally it didn't, and the cramp stayed for the whole song. Uh, and I can't, we came off and no, no one even noticed it except me. I was mortified. Yeah. Oh, no. And, and uh, uh, I, 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 we, we we're sitting backstage with Glenn and Glenn Wheatley and, and me and John and some other people in the changing room. And I said to, I said to John, look at my hand. And I showed him my hand, you know, it's just in a knot. And he said, oh, look at me. And he, he's, the side of his jaw was also, because he gets really nervous too. And that's the way it manifested in him, you know. So... <laughs> So then I changed it to, I never played it like that anymore. I started to do the, like that with the first finger. Yeah, right. Okay. Can you believe this guitar, man? This is a freaking solid body guitar. Yeah. It's freaking beautiful. Nice. So yeah, there's burn few for you. And then, you know, we, yeah. So yeah, that, I hope that answers the question. It's kind of all over the place. Uh, it's not hard to play. It, it's hard to play and get right with that making one mistake. I find that really difficult, not make one mistake, get it absolutely not perfect yep. every time. Yep. So I decide to give myself a break and say, okay, if you do, don't worry about it, just move on. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't ask, Brett, Brett played it really well too. And, nice. You know, and everybody, he worked it out. Okay. Um, there is a question there. You don't have to answer this if it's not something that you want to talk about, but yeah. uh, would you ever think about playing with Southern Suns again? Um, well, actually, I've got, I'll be 100% honest. No, I wouldn't. Um, and that's only because I've, I've been I've given this so much thought, you know. Uh, um, and people think, oh, you know, you know, I wouldn't blame them for thinking, oh, you just, you know, you, uh, are you maybe you're embarrassed about that? That, and that's completely incorrect. I mean, I, I'm very, very proud of that. I learned so much from that. 
we had we had good success for the for the short time that we had. Um, you know, the music world kind of changed, and I, that was another lesson. You know, you suddenly you know there was no more melodic rock; it was all Nirvana, and man, they just wouldn't play anything, any of our songs. They wouldn't play anymore. And that's just that's pop music. You want to play that game? Well, you got to play by the rules, and you will yeah. die by those rules if you're not really good at it at, at changing. Um, so no, it's it's not because I'm not proud of it. I love the stuff, and I'm, I'm happy for Jack and the boys to go out and play the stuff. Um, as you've probably sort of figured out from all the stuff I've been saying, I've written a lot of songs since then. I mean, 500 alone in the in the production music stuff, and I've just written this album. I wrote, I had another band called Sneak, and I wrote an album for that, which was recorded, you know, which we mixed in America with Michael Brower as well. Uh, I've, I've written a lot of stuff. I feel, I really feel like that was, a, when it was, it's 30 years ago, man. Um, I do not feel connected in a musical way. Uh, it, it, it will always be my my, my beginnings and, and, and probably be my biggest success. Um, but I do not feel connected to it. It's like there's so much stuff that's happened since then and so much with my guitar playing. Uh, I've changed uh, I've changed as a person in as much as I don't want to be in a group dynamic. I don't want, uh, and here's the thing. If it was, the question would be different. I would answer it differently. If you said, look, um, uh, say the guys came to you and said, look, we actually want to record again. Let's, let's do something. I might, um, uh, I, I probably wouldn't do it, but that would be more what I'd be more interested in that. I'm, I'm interested in new things. I'm interested in writing something new, you know. Um, uh, the reason, and the reason I wouldn't do that is because I really don't want to go in a van again and go on the road. I'm sorry, but I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did that, and you know, um, uh, I can't. I, I, am, I have a mad passion to write this style of, that I'm sort of that I've just embarked on. I really want to, I think I mentioned to you guys before that, um, and this might, might sound uh, a bit, uh, a bit of an overreach and maybe too late in life, but the guitarists that I really dug are the ones that can, that made their own world, who, who made their own music. And it, it was like a, a little universe, Alan Holsworth, um, the early Kareem stuff, um, Jimi Hendrix, um, you know, these are the people that, that, like, uh, I, I kind of, but see, I'm, I'm not, I am not coming from the I'm a uh, I'm a solo guitar player kind of point of view. I'm coming from I'm a songwriter and I just happen to play guitar, right? Um, uh, it's kind of like the I, I guess to to keep it on topic, the opposite of what Jack used to say. Because remember, we had a, a period where Jack was saying in interviews, "Look, I'm a guitar player. And I'm really a guitar player and I sing a bit." You know, well, I'm the opposite. I am a writer and I just happen to play a bit of guitar. Um, I spent a lot of time practicing guitar. Um, I stopped I stopped for a long time. Um, for those years when the band finished, or when, when as soon as Jack started singing, I wasn't soloing anymore. I really didn't care about soloing, even in the the band I had after that sneak. I didn't didn't care about soloing. I just played chords, um, and even when I was doing production music, which I did as I said for thirteen years, I did not um, pick up a guitar and, and want to play solo stuff until about two thousand and ten, I'd say. So I really had a big break from the guitar. And then I had to get my chops back. And man, that takes longer than you think. I thought, oh yeah, I can do this stuff. Mm -mm, no, there's some deep, deep things about technique that that accumulate over, I found for me, that accumulate over the years. And if you stop for too long, you've got to go back and get that core strength back. I couldn't yeah. even play a bar chord without getting cramps in my, I could wow. not hold down a chord. Um, and so I had to do a lot of practice just changing chords. You know, I couldn't even change chords because when I'm recording a song or something, it's like, yeah, I oh, screwed that up. Do that again. Uh, now this chord, yeah, what, whatever, you know. And then I'll never play that song again. It's done. Yeah. Um, but um, so to to answer the question, the reason I wouldn't do that, uh, that's I'm done. I mean, that that period is over for me, and I just really want to move on. Uh, it's nothing against the, you know, I have no, I'm, I go, I'm, they have complete, go do what they want to do, you know, go yeah. go play. I still, I'm still friends with the guys. Um, there's no animosity. There's no ill feeling. Um, it's just that I'm doing something else and I, I'm really on this path. And I, the way I look at it is this, this is, I kind of think about that is this is the last, if you put your life into three phases, this is the last phase for me. Um, and I need to do something that scares the shit out of me. I need to be, I do not need to be safe. I do not need to be comfortable. 
I need to be scared about, and I'm really scared about going and playing that live. I, I got to tell you, because this is my stuff now. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm really like, this is what I really want to do. I want, I want to look out at a room of people, even if it's, you know, 50 people or whatever that have come to see me play my stuff and then I'm going to sing it, uh, in my way. Uh, and, and I'll, I'll, and they will know what my style is because they would have listened to it before, you know, before they decided to come and see me. Um, there's a part of you that wants to, it may seem a little bit dramatic to say that I want to pick up where I left off when I, when Jack joined the band. Now, and I don't mean that in a bad way because that was a great experience. We, we had success. It was fantastic. But I was on a path then of just writing my own music. Didn't give a fuck what anyone wanted. Obviously, we're getting rejected by everybody. I want to go back to that. I want yeah. to that person. I can never be that person again, but I want to have those same true feelings of I just want to do something really new and different and 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 not be anything to do with the pop charts or the it's such a great relief not to have to, to do that but it's also scary kind of thing it's a challenge it's like because when you sit down and say okay i'm going to write this is it i'm going to now write the songs of my life this is it um this is the stuff that i really want to do okay you're really putting you you're, you're putting yourself out there again you know um and but um that's what i that's and that's why all my energy is going into that my whole all i think about is this writing uh, uh, and not just his record because let's face it albums aren't albums anymore you don't you know do a record and then tour for a year and come back and do another record it's to me writing is an ongoing thing it's like i've already written a bunch of songs since i finished the album and i, I can't wait for people to hear those you know i'm really excited about it um and the way the internet is at the moment the, the way the internet is being able to just say you know Man, I wrote to Gary Husband. You know, Gary Husband used to be the drummer for, for Alan Holsworth. He's a great, he's now the synthesizer player for John McLaughlin. And, uh, I, I, and you know, I, I asked him to, 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 to play some keyboards on a track. And because of the internet, the way it is, and if you, you know, if they've got friends that you know, and blah, blah, blah. Man, it's like, the, I never thought that you, I could do that, you know, but now I've got people like, you know, I got Virgin, bloody Jimmy Johnson on the record. So you know, for later projects, there, there's other musicians in the world. There's, there's, a, there's a great horn player in Sweden that I want to use. I, I want to do some horn arrangements for for some of the songs. I'm too excited about all that stuff, you know. I, I and you know the way I set it up. Yeah, I spent 13 years writing production music, which was just bloody hard work. But it's kind of set me up to have enough income to live and not have to do it anymore. Now I'm just retired from that, uh, and now I'm going to do what I want to do, and I and I want it. Um, I want to challenge myself as much as I can to go in different directions, to learn new stuff. Um, you know, I'm learning new stuff about jazz every bloody day. You've only got to get online to see some of the incredible players around. It's great. I love it. I love this challenge. I love um, putting myself through that ringer where, man, you know, I could I could just stop and just go, you know, hey nice career you had a bit of a success back there that was great you know but i'm it's this it's more about making new music i reckon there's a lot of music that has not been made um and new directions new just a new attitude on something and uh, i hope people can sort of hear, well you know maybe they can't well if they can't hear it on this record maybe they hear it on the next one or the one after that but i'm just gonna write till i drop basically yeah <laughs> and um i will put a band together and i will go out and play awesome um, so that's that, that's the kind of challenge I want to do, and that's why I just do not have time to go back and and do the sun stuff, you know. Cool, cool. Now, uh, one last person has just snuck in a question, and I know they're still watching because they've they've kept they've added to the question as you've been talking there, mm -hmm. and they want to know what does think what does Phil think of the Edge from U two or closer to home, Mark Lazot, aka Diesel, as players. Oh, I always thought Mark was a great player. Um, it's one of those guys that never fell for the, you know, I'm going to play it a billion miles an hour. I mean, and, and that's, you know, I'm not trying to um, say bad things about people who do, um, because there's some great players who do that stuff. Uh, but yeah, Mark, Mark was always a great player, always played the, you know, played the right, sort of the, 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 the not the money notes, but the butter notes, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and great singer as well. Uh, no huge respect for him. And of course, you know, well, you know, talking about the, uh, the edge, there's a guy, once again, he created his own little world, man. Absolutely. He created his own sound. You know, he he's plays not one note, and then four notes come out. But um, you know, it's him. 
Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, yeah, it's straight away. Huge respect. I went and see, saw them on the last concert. Um, I made a friend when I was in England. He, 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 I rented his studio um, in Brighton in, in the UK. I stayed there for six months. And he's, there's a guy called Mikey Rose, a piano player, incredible musician. Man, that was great going to England, let me tell you. Uh, I met so many great musicians. I was, it's almost like I came out of a cave and it's like, wow, there's other people and they're just amazing. Um, cool. Anyway, this guy's called Mikey Rowe and he, um, you know, he, he was Cheryl Crow's MD for 10 years in LA. He's, he was Oasis's MD for heaven's sake. And he's now playing with uh, the High Flying Birds. And of course they came out with, uh, they were touring with U2. Whenever he comes to Australia, we go out to dinner, you know, and he got us some tickets to, to U2. And man, the edges sound, fuck me man it's just a thing of beauty it really is and there's a guy who knows tone man you listen to those vox ac 30s man they, and he, he they're not normal he's messed with them you know if you yeah. if you if you if you see any interviews with his uh, guitar guy man he gets the best sound he, for, for that style of music and what he's doing yeah huge respect anyone who you know that's a that's a thing it's being a musician, being a great muso, it's not about how many notes you can play or how technically skilled you are. It's about the, you know, I hate to say it, but it's about the feel, man. It's about the time. All great, all the players that I love have incredible time. And that means you can be a jazz player, That means that, or that means you're the edge, or um, that means you're Johnny Winter, because that's his freaking time. You know, that's the time that he plays in, you know. Um, but all, all those great players, Clapton, uh, time, man, it, it, you don't have to play a billion notes. And if you do, you better be good at it because it's going to sound like shit, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, and there's a lot of great players around who've got, I mean, there's a young, young Sydney player, um, uh, Josh Mead, Josh Mead, Josh Mead, if, if you haven't heard of him, look him up, man. If you want to see technique, yep. if you want to see technical stuff, you'll just blaze, you'll just burn your face off. You know? Wow. And, you know, and, and I've seen Josh, um, I think you, you, you could quite easily not write him off, but it's always just, you know, he's a fast player. But you listen to the, the, some of the stuff that he's written himself, uh, and they're just little guitar pieces, little etudes and stuff. And, yes, he does play fast and everything, but, man, he's got something going on there. So, you know, Josh Meter, um, great player. Uh, so, you know, it's the, the thing that I always look for is the feeling thing. And, and the feeling thing for me usually comes from time people who have got great time. Robin Ford's got uh, immaculate. I mean, it's, just, it's not something you can write down and say, this is the way you should play it. This is good time. That's the feeling thing. That's the behind the note or in front of the note or beat, sorry, behind the beat or in front of the beat. It's like this syrupy thing that, that turns your, if you get it right, turns your whole playing into, you know, it's the, the secret, the secret sauce or whatever it is, you know, all great players kind of have that, that time thing. Benson, one of the greatest time players. Pat Metheny, one of the greatest time players. Oh my God, you should hear Pat ben Metheny, Pat Metheny playing or Metheny playing um, bebop. Oh my God, his time is so good. Yeah, they're the things, you know. And, and yes, he can play a lot of notes if he wants to, but he doesn't have to. You know? um, so I hope that sort of answers uh, the question. No, uh, you know, Diesel and uh, both Diesel and uh, the Edge. Great, I mean, great time, great playing. Nice Good stuff. The right, nice. the right notes. <laughs> nice. Well, I've had I've had Mark on on the show. Um, yeah, I, I watched it, man. I watched it. It was really interesting. Yeah, yeah. That was right. like we had uh, before we started some issues with the audio interface, and uh, I thought, oh no, by the time we got it started, I thought he's going to be grumpy and all that. But he, no, it, it was good. Um, yeah. yeah, and I saw him playing a couple of times recently, just on the Red Hot Summer tour that he was doing, and then he did a solo show just down the road from me as well. And his guitar tech shot me a message and said, hey, come come and say hello. And um, yeah, that it's just that feeling, that soul, yep. you know. But he's had it since he was a young guy, man. Like you know, the when he was playing with yep. bands at twenty or however old he was, he had yep. it. He had that soul then, didn't he? Yep, there it is, you know. And, that, and, that, and that's the thing we're drawn to. That's the thing we are drawn to, and, it, and it's an invisible thing. It's like this little bit of kind of magic thing. And you know, and another good example of a fast player that has had so much soul and so much time is Holsworth. You know, I mean, he took it out. He, he, yeah, he took his music thing right out there, but. Man, some of his songs, the the writing is so freaking great, you know. For what for the the style of thing he was doing, yes, he could do anything, but a lot of the times he just played a great melody. Uh, and, uh, and his chords, the the, the chord um, the chord progressions were just they were hooks, man. They are hooks. I don't care what anyone says, you know. They're, he, they're just great notes, you know. Yeah. And of course, his time is, and he's got so many people that have tried to copy him, but man, you know, I want to feel that way about Brett Garcett, you know. 
Brett has got a great sense of time. It sets him apart from so many of the other Legato players that have come along. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not about the, um, just the, the blazing kind of technique. I mean, we can all work hard on it. Men are like that. You know, men have this thing where they just will go at it doggedly and, 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 and just put so much time into getting that technique right. But at the end of the day, that's, 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 that's part of it, but it's not the whole thing. You know, it's the time as well. It's that, that thing that, that sets you apart from everybody else, your, your sense of time. Speaking of time, theory. mate, I, I Brett has I think logged in as the longest chat I've had at over three hours, and uh, you realise we've we've hit three hours and fifteen already. Are you kidding me? Have we, <laughs> it goes fast. It. Love, it goes fast. I just love talking about me, don't you? Yeah, I? yeah. Well, just this, this, mate, Phil. I, I am going to round it up, mate. But yeah. I would love to get you back on sometime, uh, another sure. time, if you're up for it. Yeah, because. Go and have the, let me know what you. I'm not the album. You can't listen to that yet. But go and have a listen to that singles. Tell me, tell me what you think. Let me know. Yep. And uh, I, I hope other guitar players sort of get to hear it. Um, uh, and uh, uh, and you know, I'm excited to, to about the rest of the album. So uh, there's, I, you know, that's a great thing. I feel like there's a lot to come. Um, and that sort of once again plays back to the other thing of why I'm, aren't I doing the sounds? I just feel that there's a whole world of stuff um to to do and I, i'm excited about it. it's like looking at a sunny day or something it's really weird to put it like that but that's what it's like it's like you're looking at a blue sky and you want to go outside that's the way i feel you know and i'm uh, so yeah whatever <laughs> awesome mate I, i've i've learned about uh, a lot about the man uh mr phil buckle and uh actually i wanted to ask you one more question before you go mm. um being that you know you 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 are a songwriter What's yep. the one song that you've written that uh, you'd like to be remembered for? Well, obviously, Burn For You's there, uh, which, with one of the most remarkable vocal performances uh, is there. Um, I could sidetrack this a little bit and say my most popular song that I've ever written is actually You Were There, which which if you add up all the play, all the plays on YouTube, it's over 10 million. Wow. Um, which, which, which is nothing compared to a lot of other bands I know. But for a little song that actually wasn't even a hit here, um, it's really on the internet. It's <laughs> and there's a, there's over a hundred people trying to play that song on the on the internet. Um, so I I think I will be remembered for that for, for that song. Um, uh, really, there's a couple of look. I'm more of a heart guy. There's stuff that makes me cry, that still brings a tear to my eye, and it's weird, isn't it? But you wrote it. Why should you get it? There's just something about the when when the chords are right and the melody is right and the vocalist is right. Okay, I did a track with um, one of the. If some, people can look it up, actually, uh, if if you're into ballads, um, into, and, and I know a lot of people aren't, but that's okay. But if you are, um, there's something that I'm really really proud of. Is this, I had a song called Hold On which is on YouTube. If you look it up, if you look Phil Buckle, hold on. Some other people have put it up. I, I didn't put it up and they've just put up like a, a dummy kind of YouTube thing. It's one of my library music songs and someone's used it on an ad somewhere and people have heard that song and really dug it. Um, it's called Hold On. And there's another song called uh, You Don't Know. Both songs sung by an amazing singer from Newcastle called uh, Beth Robertson, although she's married now. So her name is Beth Gleason. Such a beautiful singer. Um, she was like my, um, I suppose, muse. The sound of her voice was my muse for quite a bit of time. I cool. wrote a lot of songs for her, um, Beth Robertson. Um, so that's on YouTube as well. Um, so look at any 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 of those ones, I guess. But you know, of course, the 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 type of writer I am, I, I would like to say, I hope I get remembered for this, this new stuff that I'm working on, uh, because I'm not going to start talking again. Don't worry. But you know, my biggest uh, uh, asset as a writer was doing this emotional thing, right? People remember me for the ballads and even songs like uh, Heart and Danger. There's some element of, you know, emotion in that. Uh, I couldn't use any of that on this new material. Uh, none of that sort of um, emotional as far as boy, girl, or, you know, relationship, or I'm feeling like this kind of a feeling song. I had, I couldn't use it. So it's like, I've just taken off my best, you know, my strongest weapons and I can't use them. Uh, and that's what's exciting about doing this, uh, doing this new thing. So, and, and that's probably what made it a little bit harder too. But I'm getting in the swing now. I'm getting in the swing. In the swing. It's all about that swing. It's all it about is. that swing. I'll let you go, mate. <laughs> awesome, Phil. Thank you so much again, mate. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I'm just going to let the folks know that um, all these podcasts that I'm doing are actually available on as 
audio only versions on your favorite uh, podcast sites, uh, as well as being able to watch our pretty faces as we're doing it. <laughs> I, as I mentioned to you, mate, I can't go back and watch myself. I find it very hard. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's just, just how it is. Um, folks, if you enjoyed that that chat with, with Phil, please um, subscribe, like, throw some thumbs up, all that kind of stuff. And um, feel free to share this stuff because people are telling me this is one of the, the greatest kept secrets on the internet. I'm getting some great guests um, oh, who have I got in the works coming up that I haven't announced yet? You know what? I'm getting Tim Pierce on. Uh, Scott Henderson uh, a little while ago said he was going to come on, um, but he just wanted a break because he'd already done an interview somewhere. That's coming up soon. But this morning, last night, I actually got the balls to email Steve Lukather. Whoa! And I woke up. I woke up this morning to a very nice email back from him saying sure so i don't know if i should be announcing that just yet but i guess i just did um Great, man. he said he's he's away till mid mid july so after that um the luke man himself i'm still throwing some lines out there and seeing who bite so um it's nice to have had this fish on my git cats uh show phil <laughs> thank you so much mate. Wait, man. absolute pleasure Rick. uh it's time to hit my button and get the uh, little end screen to come up so once again, oh, look at this. I, I usually give everyone a round of applause. Thank you, Phil. And I'm hitting the button where we get the nice logo that goes like this.